Questlove Supreme may contain language that some of our listeners may find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Suprema, su, su, Suprema roll call. 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 This is Questlove. Yeah. da 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 Yeah. What? da 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 Fonte's in the building. Yeah. Check out my rhymes. Yeah. QLS family. Yeah. Your beef is mine. Roll call. <laughs> Suprema. I hate you. Su- su- Suprema roll call. Suprema. Su- su- Suprema roll call. My name is Sugar. Yeah. Sugar Steve. Yeah. I need a sugar free. Yeah. Commissary. Roll call. <laughs> Thanks, Boss Bill. Yeah. Winter despising. Yeah. But it's spring again now. Yeah. Temperatures rising. Roll call. Suprema. Suprema. Roll call. Suprema. Suprema. Roll call. I'm unpaid, Bill. Yeah. Rap, rapidly raps. Yeah. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Through these wiretaps. Roll call. Suprema. Suprema. Roll call. Suprema. Suprema roll call. So this like Ian. Yeah. I'm a little shook. Yeah. My verse will be better. Yeah. If I ran more books. <laughs> roll call. <laughs> Suprema. <laughs> Suprema roll call. Suprema. Suprema roll call. My name is Kathy. Yeah. I'll write those books. Yeah. yeah. Laya can read them. Yeah. I've gotten more hooks. Roll call. <laughs> Suprema. <laughs> Me P, yeah. H N I C, yeah. We on this show, yeah. Let's mother go, mother <laughs> go. <laughs> Suprema, <laughs> Suprema roll call. 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 <laughs> that was not bad. I'm glad I need one. They trying to see. That wasn't good. bad. That good. wasn't bad. Uh, Damn. Kathy, Kathy, you got Kathy balls. came through. I mean. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Quest Love Supreme. Is this our, our first double? Uh, kind of our first uh, double guest? Uh, I mean, Pete Rock and Smoke Dizzle. Okay. But he ain't talking much Smoke Dizzle, so yeah, yeah it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And there was also the episode where D'Angelo came in and was like, oh, yeah. it's funky. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's more R&B. It's more and R&B. Then, that was right. That was and then he left. <laughs> then he left. Then he left. That's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a special episode. Of, well, I feel like every episode of Quest Love Supreme is a special episode. So I don't want to make, make it like the, the Meredith Baxter Bernie episode. Of, <laughs> right. A special Meredith Baxter Bernie episode of Quest Love Supreme. Um, we have, though, like one of my freaking heroes like one of my rhyming heroes a, 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 a cultural icon in the world of music not i mean above hip-hop above i mean music just a, a for me like one of the illest writers poets mcs as an mc to me he has the best opening lines in yes rap Yes. We'll talk more about but we will. Yeah. Like I tell MCs all the time, you have like four bars to get my attention, but he kind of made it even worse because it's like comes okay, in the door. Yeah, you only got one bar. So Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Which, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prodigy of my yo, 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 yo. Uh, what up though? In addition, we have his co conspirator. Uh now what makes it great is that our special guest, Kathy's kind of family to uh, some of us Questlove Supremers that have started on the OK Player boards. She's my favorite Lauren Hill stan of all time. <laughs> <laughs> right off the gate. Well, I mean, that's how you came to my attention. I was like, who? I mean, before the day of social media, I mean, OK Player was like the original Twitter. That was the original. That shit was gladiator school, man. Yeah. It was. It, it was like, gladiator school. We, I feel like we pioneered the social media game before social media was a thing. Nah, for real. And uh, I just knew that 
this person was standing, <laughs> taking Lauren Hill stands to the next level. That's how you got my attention. But I mean, you blossomed to your own as a writer. I mean, you've written Thank for you. a lot of periodicals and and from BT uh, dot com to I mean all Billboard, the way to pitch, Billboard, Stone, Pitchfork, Pitchfork, etc. The P word, Pitchfork. Yeah. Wow, that's. <laughs> But you've also collaborated with Prodigy on on uh, his book. Yes, yes. The proper title is Commissary Kitchen: My Infamous Prison Cookbook. Is this the first book you worked on, or N- no? But legally, I can say this is the first <laughs> book I've worked on. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. I see. Well, welcome Thank both you. of you to Quest Love Supreme. Yep. I, I got to say, Prodigy, that I'm I'm really not big on hip hop autobiographies actually haven't read one myself. I mean, there's a lot of books that have been written by hip hop luminaries, but I got to say none. You said you're not a fan of hip hop autobiographies yet. You wrote one. (laughs) No, I know that, but I'm just saying that it's usually for me, like most people that are in the genre really don't open up as much. It's almost like a moment of their childhood and then they came to music and then then we got here. Right. It, It really doesn't, really doesn't let you like inside of like the mechanics of what makes them work as a person like you know them as a personality like there's really not much you learn from the dmx book or this snoop book or like those things so but i'm just saying that or even the ghostface book you know what i'm saying <laughs> which exactly like this is more of a comedy book to you than like a life story book but um i guess so that's read it like three years ago like it's yeah, it's sorry. a gripping ass story man it Thank you. We listened to the audio book on tour. Like we ran, we had to do like a long tour run, and we had the audio book, and that got us through the whole tour. That's like that shit was crazy. That's what's up, man. Yeah. So, Prodigy. Um, I'm not gonna say. Let's start from the beginning. <laughs> I mean, I mean, no, I'm like all up in this. You know, I'm. But actually, my th- this is this is a rarity. Yeah. My my favorite part of a Prodigy story is actually his beginnings. Yeah. I know we all like to you know no, I'll, get no, to the real. good part. But, I mean, you you come from a lineage that I didn't know. We have something in common. We're both products of doo-wop. I, don't, I won't say a dynasty, but, I mean, you know, you grew up actually with two doo-wop parents. Yeah, my which, mother and my father, yeah. Yeah. Who was your father? Bud Johnson. He, you know, uh, my grandfather was named Bud Johnson also, but right. my father was Bud Johnson. He was in a group called The Chanters. Now your grandfather was a, a, a jazz musician. Yeah, as well, yeah. Right? That Bud Johnson Senior, he uh, he was a you know big into jazz and like a uh, big band. Like him and Quincy started a big band together like, with Dizzy Gillespie right. and a bunch of different people. Man, like my grandfather used to have all these jazz OGs coming to the crib when I was a little kid. So I used to be in the crib and Dizzy used to make his, the, the, his the face cheek, puffy right. for me and all yeah. that like. Yeah. That was crazy growing up around all that because I didn't realize what was happening until I got older and think back about it. Like, oh, wow, that's that was a, my grandfather had me around all them jazz greats. Like, you know what I mean? But I, I, I didn't really get to appreciate his style of music until I got older. You know what I mean? I, it wasn't, I just didn't get it when I was a kid. Like, but you know to ask what you, mean? at what point in your life did it click? Like, I was around. I don't think no one ever gets it when, like, your parents' music when you're a kid, and only when you're older. But right, but at, is it high school? Is it like I'm not even understanding um, until I'm probably like, probably like, yeah, in high school when uh when I first started making beats, um then I understood like the power of my grandfather's music because we would sample a lot of jazz records, you know what I mean? And he left me like his collection, his jazz record collection, and we made a lot of the. Uh, the first album, Infamous, and uh, Juvenile Hell, the from songs the, that we the did collection? produce. Yeah, from our grandfather's uh, records. Like, See, um, Shook Ones was made, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, the Herbie my, Hancock records. Yeah, that made was my from... grandfather's records. Damn! Right? <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, once we got to that point, we was like, actually researching the records and like using certain samples, and we, we was like, oh, this, I understood the power of the jazz music, and, and I started listening to it like more in depth and paying attention to it, then I started to, you know, appreciate what did he, he what take he you to see in any of his shows when you were younger and hell yeah, man. I remember being at so many shows. But once one in particular that stand out a lot is at the Blue Note. My grandfather used to perform there. Uh-huh. And um I used to sit at the bar with my pops and 
I used to think I was drinking. You know what I mean? My pops would be ordering a real drink, and he would order me like a 7-Up with the cherry, cherry syrup. syrup. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, same thing. <laughs> I'd be sitting at the bar drinking like <laughs> a right. little kid, like, you know what I mean, at the bar. So I got memories like that of my grandfather performing while me and my pops sitting at the bar watching him. And, um, yeah, you know, just different different shows and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, man, it's, I was lo- I would definitely feel blessed to got it. I got a chance to see him perform. You know what I mean? I remember that clearly. Well, that, too. that even makes it more special because I know earlier you told me that you're about to do a residency at Blue Note. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Wow. It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy being in there. We did the first show last month. Okay. And it's crazy being in there because I just it places like it feels small because you know when you're a little kid everything seems bigger. Big like, you right. know what I mean? So now I'm in there. I'm like, damn, this is smaller than my memories. Mm-hmm. But it's like it's so surreal being in there and performing in it because I just remember my grandfather doing it. So it's crazy how you know things turn around, you know, come full circle. Was he a horn player? Or... Yeah, clarinet and tenor saxophone. Okay. Uh, and even before that, uh, I think your great grandfather started Morehouse. Was... Yeah, my my great. I think he was like three times great, 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 great grandfather. <laughs> like. Uh, Yo, you know how lucky you are to even know firsthand, man. Like, like I just found out who my greats were like two weeks ago. <laughs> wow. Seriously, my moms, man. But like the fact that you know the history of your great, great, great. My mother, she did the gene- genealogy. Okay. And you know she researched, and we got some other family members that did the same thing and researched, and we we found our whole family. Like you know what I mean. Plus we got a lot. My my. My grandmother on my mother's side, she keeps a lot of family photos and just history and stuff. So we were able to like put pieces together to connect dots, like, you know what I mean? So it's pretty it's pretty interesting, man. I learned a lot about my family while I was locked up. My moms used to write me and tell me, Use this in your book, put this in your book, this is important. You know what I mean? Right. Or <clears throat> So, um and your mother was a member of the Crystals. Yeah. Yep. Um, my mom was like walking down the street somewhere. I don't know, I don't know if it was Queens or whatever, wherever she was at. And somebody stopped her and was like, hey, can you sing? And she was like, no. <laughs> really? And they was like, you sure? We need an extra member for this group because one of the members had dropped out. Right. So they convinced her to do it. She was only 18. They convinced her to do it. And she became a part of the group and went right on tour. You know what I mean? So it was it was kind of crazy how she so got So in the mid-60s, she was a... Wow. <clears throat> yeah. It was just like random. Like somebody just, she just so happened to be walking down the street and they stopped her like, because I guess, you know, my mother, she was very pretty, like with light eyes. So they, she had the look. Yeah. <laughs> so they stopped her like, yo, can you sing? We want, we need you in this group. Come on. And are y'all like a generational New York family? Like, is that where yeah, your my, people? My whole family's from Southside Jamaica, Queens. And before that, they come from like Texas and Virginia. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, the crystals are for like our listeners. Um, I I would always say that. Like I grew up in an oldies doo wop family, but similar to like parents today, like I'll say like Kamal from the Roots, my keyboard player, tricked his kids into thinking like Michael Jackson was brand new. You know, as a parent, you be trying to trick your kids into like, <laughs> you know, like or That's even fair. like my production manager. Uh, uh, like his sons think that like Eric being rock him is new. Uh, even uh, Kirk, my guitar player, would play Slick Rick so much for his son that his son actually like the first time he, he ever had to reprimand his son about a school project. And I heard these words. He's like, "Son, you can't bite someone else's rhymes." <laughs> like. <laughs> I guess in, in kindergarten, oh, Kirk wow. said, someone was supposed to do a writing assignment. You said Slick Rick. I thought that was going to go somewhere. So <laughs> oh, no. I thought so you were about to tell him, lick the balls. Right, <laughs> right. Like, something crazy. Like, no, no. He, he, he said that uh, he, he took, like, plagiarized, like, some of a children's story and oh, made wow. it like it was his own okay. own joint. But, like, just I'm just fascinated at how parents will trick you into thinking that that's your contemporary music. So I grew up. Just with, you know, an oldies doo-wop dad that would always play, like, the Crystals, Harvey and the Moon Glows, like, all those groups. So, like, you know, I grew up thinking, like, He's a Rebel was, like, some new shit when I came. <laughs> like, I had the 45 at home, so. That's it. 
Yeah, I, I was I was surprised to find that out. So, like in the beginning, did you did you have any designs of being an entertainer? Or were you just like observing it and just like, oh, that's their shit? And... Yeah, um, nah. In the beginning, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do until I turned like man, maybe like twelve, thirteen, and I first heard. I think it was when I first heard, you know, LL Cool J and uh, Run DMC, the Sucker MCs, and Rock the Bells. When I heard those songs, that just changed everything in my life. You know what I mean? That made me, I was like, all right, this is what I want to do. This is this is what I like. I used to play the songs for my mother. Like, yo, mom, check this out. You know what I mean? I used to play, a, uh, you know, the paid in full. Matter of fact, I used to say Rock Kim's rhymes to my mom to act like I wrote it. <laughs> and she'd be like, oh. Did you, you always have this deep, deadpan voice as a kid? Because, <laughs> like, you are Rock Kim's, like, Vocal double yeah, ganger. I, I don't know. That's just that's just my voice. Yeah, hell yeah. So, um, I used to say I used to say rock and roll to my mom. She used to be like, "Oh my God, you're really good." And I used to be like, "I ain't say nothing to her." I used to be like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm rap, mom, I'm a rap." <laughs> but I I first got turned on to hip hop music when I was like 12, 13. Before that, um, you know, like like you said, it was a lot of it was a lot of doo wop in the crib, like you know, um. Soul music, you know what I'm saying? A lot of church, church music, you know what I mean? You were born, was it, were you born in Long Island or? I was born in Hempstead, yeah, Long okay. Island. Yep. I know that Chuck D and Flav always talk about Hempstead. And they, they Chuck D and Flav Murphy. from the town right next to me in Roosevelt. Roosevelt, yeah. Roosevelt. okay. You know what I mean? That's okay. right next to Hempstead. So we all like. Was they, Hempstead EPMD? I know that someone nah, rhymes about Hempstead. EPMD was uh, Brentwood. It okay. was from Brentwood. Hempstead. You remember Son of Berserk? Yes. Yeah, wow. Son of Berserk was from Hempstead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know Wait, I love that you just brought up, <laughs> like for me, Son of Berserk, I feel like I'm the only person that got that record and worshipped the shit out of it. Like I used to see, I used to go outside to the store and Son of Berserk be outside. Word. He's like, yo, Sean, what up, kid? Like, With we, that old man voice. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because we was like the little dudes using the studio. There's a famous studio in, in Hempstead that Public Enemy started in. Son of Berserk. Yeah, they would do their pre-production out there. It was called 510. Yeah, yeah. So that's where we all started. Like, Buster would be out there sometimes. Yeah. So that's where we all started. So everybody used to be over there, like, and we used to see everybody over there. Um, but yeah, man, like Hempstead. Uh, I think Method Man from Hempstead. He's oh, okay. from Terrace, Terrace Ave. You know what I mean? Um, I'm trying to think of who else from out there. Uh, Rock Marcy. Okay. From Hempstead. You know. Um. Those are the few that I can remember. Oh, okay. The top, yeah. So, like, what eventually brought you to the the city, to Queens? Um, when I turned like eleven, twelve, my mom's moved to Left Rack. She moved to Left Rack City. Um, her and my pops had split up because my pops had did some crazy shit. My pops was wild, man. Mm -hmm. He uh, he had kidnapped me, took me to Detroit. We was living in Detroit for a minute, balling out of control. He was working in the stock market. Oh, wow. Doing some crazy shit. And um, When did you live in Detroit? Man, this is like early 80s. When Scarface, what year did Scarface come out? 83. 83. Yeah, because my pops took me to the <laughs> Wait, movie. Wait, why are we? <laughs> I remember that. What was the family feud? <laughs> 83. <laughs> my pops took me to the movies in Detroit when at the premiere when Scarface first came out. So that's when I was out there in 83. Wow, wait, yeah. you were nine. I was nine, yeah. So so the lyric, he, your uh, pop taught you how to shoot when you were seven. That was real. That really Oh, yeah, my it. pop, man. He was off dog, man. That 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 boy is, is something else. <laughs> he, was, he was something else, man. Was he a musician as well? Or like Yeah, he he was a singer. You know what I mean? Um, like I said, he had that group, the Chanters, doo wop group. Right. They had a couple of dope songs, you know what I mean? Um But my my father's things was computers, like from the early eighties. He I remember being like probably five, six years old. My father was working on Macintosh writing programs. You know what I'm saying? Really? Um, he was really, really dope with it. Um, I think it's a school called TCI. I think it's called TCI. Mm -hmm. um, my father went there, and he actually got so good, he became a, like a professor there. He started teaching. He was in the commercials and all that Like after a while. He got really nice with it. And, um, you know, that's what he was into, computers, heroin, Alcohol, karate. My father had a, a dojo on Jamaica Avenue. 
You know what I mean? So he used to teach karate. You just said that combo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just with like, wait, can we, right. can, we, can we back that up one second? He's off the hook. He's off the hook. Karate yeah. and computer. Yeah. It's, it's computer. crazy. Professor yeah. Pimp. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. all that. It's very crazy, man. My pop's life was wow. It, it, it was wow. Um, that was his thing. He loved computers and he loved fighting and just doing wild shit. He was crazy, man. <laughs> And I know that you you have a closeness with uh, your grandmother as well, that she was in the arts. Yeah, yeah. My grand my grandmother was ill. She was uh, she was one of the first Cotton Club dancers when they first opened a Cotton Club way back. And uh, you know she was friends with Lena Horn. Lena Horn used to dance there early before she became famous. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's how my grandmother met my grandfather because my grandfather used to play in the band at the Cotton Club. So that's how they met. And, um, you know, after my grandmother started a dance school business in the basement of her crib on the guy Brewer. And she started with, like, five students, you know what I mean? And it just grew and grew over the years until to the point where she started renting the building. And then it grew to a point where she actually bought her own commercial building in Queens. She was, like, the first black woman to own a commercial space in Queens. So, you know, it was a dance school business. You right. You know what I mean? She was, that was her thing, dancing, so... A lot of her students, man, she has some famous students that she uh, that she raised. Like Ben Vereen is one of her. she raised oh, Ben Vereen, like you know what okay. I mean. Okay. Okay. And uh, he used to, you know, be at he the house to... all the time, like you know what I mean. And anytime he had something going on, we used to watch it in the crib. I done seen Roots thousands of times, like you know what I'm saying. Ben's like, on TV. Yeah, okay. you know what I mean. That's like everybody get together, watch Ben. Ben is on. Um, you know Michael Peters. He was a famous choreographer. For oh, Michael that was Jackson's one of my um, best choreographer. Yeah. Yes. So Michael Peters was. That's my grandmother's. That was one of my grandma's students. Shut yeah. up. Damn, he did so much shit. He did beat it. He Creole, did dancing thriller, on the ceiling. Yeah, he did yeah. all those. So like, yeah. that was like events. Same thing. Like with Ben Vereen. Matter of fact, Mike, Michael something. Peters is the in the the beat it, knife knife yeah. battle. Yeah. He's the one in all yeah. white. All yeah. oh, That's, yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. Michael Peters. The one that got their hands tied up. They yeah, fighting yeah. with the knife. When I was six, my dad introduced me to him, and I was like. But you can't dance better than Michael Jackson. And he walked away with me with so much attitude. Like, yeah, I went. Like, he, like um, I remember when I was a little kid, like, we used to fly to Cali because a lot of her students live in Cali and whatnot. Um, so we used to fly to Cali and visit them, and she used to take care of some business. And Michael Peters used to take me to Universal Studios all the time. That was my favorite place when I was a little kid. I used to be like, let's go again. Oh, with the let's go again. Let's the... go again. I have yeah. been there like 100 times when I was a kid. That was my favorite shit. Like, you know what I mean? But, um... Yeah, so this is my grand. This is like my grandmother's life. She, she, uh, you know, this is her her thing in the dance world, and she got a lot of choreogra choreographers, and she uh, she helped out a lot of people with, in, as far as that in that world. So I I grew up a lot around her concerts. She would do these concerts every year at Lincoln Center, at the Apollo, at uh, Carnegie Hall. You know, um, every year she would do like a big concert and. Um, so you were a, a backstage kid. Yeah, me and my cousins would be backstage, wilding, looking at the girls getting dressed in this You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's world. different than my backstage. <laughs> <laughs> I just watch old, old ass dudes, you know, <laughs> smoke reefer in the. Whoa, yo! <clears throat> but he um, had a better backstage experience. Yeah, especially at my grandmother's dance school. She, like hundreds. Y'all the Jones be there. Hundreds of girls from Queens, like. <laughs> That right. was like, that was, that was, man, I used to love that place when I was a little kid, man. We had so much fun running around Jamaica Avenue and, you know, just having fun, man, with all, all the girls that did. And it was crazy, crazy growing up, like, you know what I mean? So when when did you officially, you, you moved to Queens when, and... So I moved to Queens. Well, uh, after Detroit, or? Yeah, it had to be like 84. Okay. Like 84, 85, I moved to Left Rack with my mom. She got divorced from my pops. After he kidnapped me, and she was tight. She was like, "Man, I ain't doing this shit no more, man." <laughs> Wait, how did she find you? She, see, my pops had actually took me on a robbery. Well, he went and robbed a jewelry store. When I was in the <laughs> car. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> in the, in the... Wait a minute, I need a siren for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Wow. <laughs> and that shit pissed my moms off because you know what I mean. We got into a high speed you chase think? with no way. Nassau County police is chasing us and. He finally pulls over because he realized, you know, I'm in the car. He <laughs> he jumps in the car and throws a big ass bag of jewelry in my hand. I'm like, this whole nose jewelry and shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he's flying through Hempstead like it was out in Long Island. 
And, you know, finally he pulls over. You know, I remember the cop put me in the back. And my, my pop's hand was locked up behind his back. I remember holding my pop's hand. While his really? Hand, yeah, they had me in the back seat with him. I didn't know what was going on. I'm like, I was too young to even Process compute that. what the fuck was happening. Um, get to the precinct. Police gave me a soda. I remember sitting there drinking the soda. My mom's came to get me, and I remember her arguing with my pops, flipping on him. Like, and then my pops kidnapped me right after that. You know what I mean? Because she was like, oh, I can't be with you no more. So he took me to Detroit, and um, my mom's found out where I was at. She threatened to have, you know, call the cops on them. So he, he sent me back or whatever. My mom's, then we moved to Left Rack. And then uh, I went to school in Left Rack. We went, I went to junior high school in Left Rack. I said, you went to Halsey, right across the street from Long Island. You know, right across the street from the LIE. Mm -hmm. You got to cross the LIE to get over to the high school. Now, I'll, I'll say that the, the picture that I always think of when I think of Queens is more or less the picture that you guys painted on the infamous. Dang. But was it always like that? Like when you first got to to Queens, was it that? Because you paint a dark ass. Real bleak. As, <laughs> what was Queens like? I mean, at that. This is when crack first came out. When I moved to Left Rack, crack just hit the street. It was brand new. You know what I'm saying? I'm in junior high school. I'm 12 years old. All the little kids my age were selling crack in the neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? I used to go to school and see these little niggas with rope chains and levers and Air Max. I'm like, what the fuck is these niggas doing? Like, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, these little kids, like, you know what I'm saying? With big jewelry on, looking like Eric B. and Rakim on the cover of their album. Like, right. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, I started getting cool with people out there and they started telling me what they're doing. You know what I mean? And um, Left Rack was. Big time for like selling crack. Like it's well known that Left Rack City was like big, big, big time crack neighborhood. Like you know what I mean. And Left Rack is his proper name. Left Rack, yeah. Okay. Because I always, I think when uh, Akinelli. tragedy, oh, well. right? Yeah. yeah. Like Akinelli, I thought that was a Noriega title y'all made up. There. Okay. You know what I mean, they used to they call it Left Rack Iraq. That's what that's what Nori okay. say. Okay. Like, left Rack is Iraq. Queens Bridge is Kuwait. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. But uh, yeah. So Left Rack. That's how I was out there. Um, this is when crack first hit. So, you know, all my friends don't go into junior high school. They selling crack. And, you know, once I got cool with them and they told me what they was doing, I was like, man, you know, let me try my hand at that. I want so I want a chain too. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, well, I want to look fly like y'all need. Right. So I hooked up with one of my homies from school. He gave me a few vows. He was like, all right, start with this. You know what I'm saying? If you could do this off, good. Come back, I'll give you some more. Like, you know what I mean? So I went out. I'm 12 years old. I'm looking like I'm eight. When I was 12, I looked like I was eight, yo. So yeah, you, you definitely found the fountain of youth, man. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't even outside. think you're in your 30s or 40s now. Like I go outside with, with with the little cracks on me and whatnot, and I'm super paranoid. I never sold a crack in my life. You know right. what I'm saying? So I'm like, I'm looking around. I'm nervous. Motherfuckers walking up to me like, yo, you got something? I'm like, I don't know. It's like that scene from Paid in Full. Right. <laughs> Remember when fucking A right. was like scared when he first saw the crack? Mm -hmm. Just like that. I was fucking paranoid, yo. So anyway, I think I saw one vow and the police ran up on me. Damn. You know what Your I'm saying? first time? First time. Damn. Police ran up on me. They grabbed me. Yo, what the fuck you doing out here? I like, found the cracks. They was like, how the fuck? How old are you? I'm like, I'm 12. They're like, what the fuck? You look like a little kid. Like, you look like a real little kid. Like, go home, man. Fuck you doing out here? And he just took the crack and sent me home. So now uh -oh. I got to explain to this nigga what happened with the cracks. Ah, crap. You know what I'm saying? He like, yo, what happened? I'm like, yo, police just took it and they let me go. He like, yeah, now nah, you got to give me that bread, son. So we have a scrap, you know what I'm saying, at school. He want a scrap. I lost, you know what I'm saying? I'll right. take, I'm taking my jacket off. He snuffed me. Oh, I'm like, oh, shit. So yeah. these girls break it up. Some girls I knew from the hood broke it up. Like, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I ain't fuck with the cracks no more. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this is? For a minute, for a minute. And, um, you know, I just I just was just cool with everybody after that. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't trying to, you know, really sell no drugs and get caught. That was too much for me. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then um, once I went to high school, and uh, I met Hav. So, um, yeah, Hav brought me out to Queensbridge when I first, you know, uh, went to high school, when I first met him. And um, he introduced me to that whole world. It's just different. 
Now, mind you, when I was when I was a kid, my mother, you know, my mother, her whole life, she worked for the Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. So she worked in all the projects in New York, Brooklyn, Harlem, and you know what I mean, Queens. And Queensbridge was one of the projects that she worked in. Her job was she would get people approved for their apartments. You know what I mean? So they come to her to apply for Right, her. she worked in the office on the hill in Queensbridge, and, you know, people got to come to her, and she decide whether... Assign them. You know what I'm saying? If they make enough money to live in the projects or, you know, subsidize rent or whatever, how that works. Everybody wanted to be her friend. Yeah. So she worked in Queensbridge when I was a little kid. You know what okay. I'm saying? And I used to go with her to work in the summertime. This is before I met her and all that. And uh, I went to Reese Day Camp. Like, when my mom was at work, she would drop me at day camp on the hill called Reese. So I, I was already out there for a few years when I was a little kid. I met a bunch of people. And it just so happened that years later, you know, when, once I moved to left, I went to high school in, in the city. Met half. Now I'm back in Queensbridge. Now I'm older now. And I'm seeing people I remember when I was a kid from day, from day camp and all that. Right. But um, it was just being back out there and just seeing, you know, how Queensbridge was like a, just a whole other world. Like the fashion, the slang, like... You know, just everything is just different. Okay, can you explain something to our listeners? Done. And by our listeners, uh, 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 me. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> by our listeners, I mean me. What is the Dunn language, and what is the genesis of the Dunn language? What's that, like Dun Dunny? Like so Dunn. Dun Dun, the Dun language. That's like saying we, we like say, I know cats in Sweden that talk the Dun. Like <laughs> after Mob Deep shit came out, yo, what up, Dun? And so, I was like, what are y'all talking about? It's so a th. One too. of our homies, yeah. Yeah, one of our homies from Queensbridge, his name is Bumpy. Uh, he got like a speech impediment. To me. He speak with like a lisp a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you know, that's where it comes from. We call each other son. Everybody right. be like, yo, what up, son? What up, son? And when Bumpy say it, he be like, what up, thank? What up, thank? So, we, you know what I'm saying? Yo. <laughs> yeah, Bumpy, you think? Finally. <laughs> After Whoa. 25 years, I've been wondering. So, it's so T-H-U-N. Yeah, yeah, it's T-H-U-N. But I had short, when I write my rhymes, I try to like, I write shorthand. I try to write short as possible. So, right. I used to write D-U-N just to write it real quick and get it out of the way. You know what I'm saying? So, it's like two different spellings when I do it. But whatever. Um, That's where it started, with Bumpy. You know what I'm saying? And... We just started calling shout it out to Bump. The Dunn yeah. language. He created the Dunn language. That's what we, you know what I mean? We thank you. Yeah, shout out to Bump, man. But yeah, once I got out there and I, I just seen how that world was in Queensbridge. And I remember being out there as a kid. When I was out there, it was like super early 80s. Like probably the Juice Crew was popping like back right. then. Right. Was, was anyone running with I, I Molly Mall or those guys? Or? I was too young back in the days, you know what I'm saying, when I was in day camp. But right. I remember how they used to dress. They used to have the shell top. They used to have the Pumas with the, you know, the tall one suits, mm -hmm. the Kango. I remember seeing people dressed like that when I was a kid. So I know that was like probably that Juice Crew era. And then when I came back out there later on, you know, it was it was new things happening. You know what I'm saying? It was like that era was starting to change. You know what I'm saying? Things were starting to change. And, um, you know, I was like right smack dab in the middle of it, man. And... um you know, it was just interesting to see being from Hempstead and going to school in Manhattan, you know, where I may have at. We went to high school with everybody from New York, different boroughs, Brooklyn, the Bronx, you know, Manhattan, Queens. They, they, they was from everywhere in mm -hmm. high school, art and design, you know what I mean? So we had friends with people from all over East Borough. So we used to hang out, you know, we used to party in the Bronx, up by Yankee Stadium and Sheridan. We used to, you know, hang out in Brooklyn and Bed-Stuy, Marcy, Tompkins, Sumner. You know what I mean? We used to, we was out there. You know what I'm saying? Hempstead. So was there, was there ever any he hesitation whatsoever? Because I know if you go to a different part of town that you're not necessarily from, it could be yeah. a caution thing, like, you know. Yeah, I mean, you got to be careful, man. I mean, look, growing up, you know what I'm saying? This this is this is where things changed for me a little bit. All right. My first year of high school, um, there was this gang called the Decepticons. Mm -hmm. You know yep. what I'm saying? And I used to come to school in the morning and uh I used to see people coming to school, my friends coming to school with big ass cuts going across their face, their arms, hands, like buck fifties, they faces spliced open, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, what the fuck happened to you, son? And like, yo, the Decepticons just caught us in the train station. You know, they 
I'm like, well, I'm like, yo, the niggas ain't cutting me like that, dog. I'm buying a gun right now. Because I dare a nigga try to cut me like that. that like, these niggas was twisted. You know what I'm saying? Right. So that kind of, it kind of forced me into a position where I was like, I'm defense to protect myself. Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. So that's when I bought my first gun because of that. You know what I'm saying? Because I wasn't going to let nobody cut me in the face like that. You know what I'm saying? And they was running around doing this on a daily. Like, this is what they was doing. Like, they was from Brooklyn. Like, you know what I mean? It was just a gang. They was called Decepticons. They had a female version called the Decepticons. They had another gang called the Low Lives. Low Lives. They had yeah. another gang called, uh, uh, I can't think of it right now. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, there was, there was like this gang culture from Brooklyn. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we had to deal with that. You know, because after school, they would come up to different schools and terrorize motherfuckers, robbing motherfuckers, like, you know what I'm saying? So it forced me and my little tight friends yeah. to be on some bullshit. It forced us to be on some bullshit, you know what I'm saying? And that's that's where the bullshit started a little bit, like, you know what I'm saying? Right. That's like fresh meat. Like you know what I'm saying? And then, um, you know, also just growing up in Hempstead, you know, that's like, it's a hood. That's a hood out there. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's a residential area. They got houses. It look nice. But that's the hood out so there. So Hempstead wasn't the the cozy part of Long Island that... Nah, Hempstead... Because when I think of not. Long Island, I think of like, oh, that's a vacation spot or... Yeah, nah, nah. You, you were... Uh, <laughs> that's that's where I grew up. <laughs> Where'd you grow You grew up in Hempstead, Bill? No, I grew up a few miles north of Hempstead, but... Oh, okay. It's a little, diff- <laughs> little different where I'm from. Yeah, there's a, there's a part where you cross the track. As soon as you cross the track, you call it track side. Right. As soon as you cross that track, it's over. Oh. You in the hood. <laughs> Sir, you know I think Serge explained yeah. that on his episode yeah. that, yeah, it was... You know, I had a lot of friends out there. We did a lot of things, and, you know, it put me on some shit mentally. You know what I'm saying? Just, and my, my pops already had me on some shit mentally. But then going to school in Manhattan, you know, that really kind of changed me because I started hanging out in all the different boroughs. I, I had friends from different boroughs. And uh, we used to deal with this type of shit. What school did you go to? Art and design in Manhattan. The fame school. Yeah, that's that's what. That's all right. Nah, that's that's uh. Laguardia. Laguardia. Yeah. So there's another art and design. My my mother went to to that school. She graduated from. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what did you and Havoc both go to the school for? Because so Hav was a grade ahead of me. He was there for architecture. He was Mm -hmm. dope. He used to build like scale models of like. You know, apartment complexes or whatever building, like you know what I mean. He could do that shit nice. I went to school there because this is all most of my friends was from Left Rack. You know, we used to sit around in the summertime. Where you going to high school, son? He's like, oh, we going to Edison. Oh, I'm going to this one. Mm-hmm. And most of my friends was like, yo, we going on design. So I was like, fuck, I'm going there too. Then I'm going wherever y'all niggas is going. Right. So that's the only reason I wanted to go there. You know what I'm saying? I didn't really have. I didn't think that I had any art skills. Like, you know what I'm saying? I had to take a test to get into school. That's what I thought. You okay. had to bring a portfolio up. So I was like, all right, how, what am I going to do? How the fuck am I going to get into school? I'm going to work my way into school somehow. So I thought, and I was like, oh, all right. I'm a, there's, this, there's this group called the Shirt Kings. they like clothing designers. In, oh, the airbrushing. Yeah, and airbrushing in the Coliseum in Queens. So, you know, I grew up with them, like, I grew up as a little kid on Jamaica Avenue. Like, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. they know me all my life. Like, you know what I mean? So I was like, light bulb, I'm going to just copy. I'm going to bite the shirt kings. I'm sure these <laughs> I'm sure these motherfuckers in art and design, they never seen no shit like that before. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I just got me some shirts. I got me some markers, and, uh, some paint, whatever. And I just drew some graffiti on the shit. And I made a portfolio, brought it to school. And they was like, oh, they liked it. And I got in, I got into school with that shit. I was shocked. I was like, oh, shit, that shit work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Word. This is crazy hearing this. This is That's your story. Right. No, it was Tariq's story. Right. Oh, where? Because Tariq was was art was an art design student. So he used to make, like, crazy medallions and those Yo Baby Yo Mickey Mouse <laughs> t-shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah, man. Shit mad like creative, that. Mad creative, mad creative. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I, I got a love for being creative by mm-hmm. being at that school. Like, you know what I'm saying? I got a love for photography because we had photography class there. A love for, you know, just design and shit and seeing what Hav used to do with the architecture. It just, you know, opened my mind to something new. You know, um... So how did y'all... How did you guys meet? You met in high school? Yeah, we met. My first year of high school, my photography class was a kid named Black from the Bronx. And we got real cool, kicking it every day in class. And one day he was like, yo, man, he was like, 
I used to wear mad jewelry. Like I used to have crap. I thought I was slick Rick, dog. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I used to have hands full of rings, mad chains and shit. Still, I, I was retarded when I was in school. Like you know what I'm saying? That's another reason why I bought a gun too, because I'm like I'm a target with all this shit on. Yeah, I was you gonna say like, like you didn't feel like <laughs> defenseless. I, I, and... I was I was bugged out as a kid, yo. You know what I'm saying? I didn't really care too much. So you know, um, when I met half. It was because of my man Black from the Bronx photography class. He was like, yo, man, you know, you should meet my, my one of my friends. His name Havoc. Y'all both rap. Y'all both about the same height. You know, um, I'm going to introduce you to him after school. Mm-hmm. So little did I know that these niggas were setting me up to rob me. Oh. Wait, what? Oh. Havoc. Wait, this is an arranged marriage yeah, that was <laughs> an arranged <laughs> robbery? Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, this is the greatest story I've ever heard Plot in my twist. life. It's like the greatest life ever. They they were setting me up that day. They were, it was like a whole setup. They was gonna rob me. You know what I'm saying? And whatever. I ain't find this out till later. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like later when you're on a promotion, bro. Like, oh yo, you remember when we first met? <laughs> yeah, may, maybe like a year or two later. They came. <laughs> and they was like, yo, remember that time? We was like, yo, we was gonna rob you that day, son. But, you know, you was cool, so we was like, nah, I don't rob him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's our story, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Word, that's real shit, too, man. You know what I'm saying? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me that initially your meeting was a setup. You came in the name of, oh, we should be in a group together. Yeah, but- I, I, I was like, I'm cool with Black. We cool. King, he seemed like a cool dude. He said he wanted to introduce me to somebody that rapped, too. We about the same height. He was like, yo, y'all should make a group. I'm going to introduce you to him after school. I'm like, all right, bet. So after school, we go outside, and there's a fight right here in front of the school. So I'm like, we looking at the fight, and my man Black is like, that's that's Havoc right there fighting. He fighting that kid. So have I seen Havoc. He was fighting some kid. Kid actually tried to stab Havoc. Missed, missed him. Hit his, like, leather jacket, and, like, motherfuckers dropped niggas, like, got the knife out of his hand, had beat him up. And everybody lifted half up in the air. Like he just like he just <laughs> like hit the, the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, like he just hit the winning game touchdown. <laughs> 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 they, was, they was jumping with him in the air like this, I swear to God. All the way to the train station after the fight. Damn. He was calling him Kiwi, because that was like his name, like his name is Kiwan. Right. So his like nickname in school was like Kiwi. They used to call him Kiwi. And they used to call me Pee-Wee. You know what I'm saying? Because I was mad small. Like, you know what I'm saying? That would have been a better group name, Kiwi and Pee-Wee. <laughs> 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 So, you know, we following him to the train station. I'm like, this is crazy. He's like, all right. So after they put him down, we get on the train. We meet each other. So I'm like, yo, where we going? He's like, we're going to Ravenswood. I'm like, Ravenswood? I'm like, my grandmother from Ravenswood. My mother's mother. Right. You know what I mean? She had moved from South Jamaica Projects to Ravenswood, like, some time ago. He was like, a word? He's like, my grandmother from Ravenswood. So both our grandmothers lived in Ravenswood. So right there, that was like... We had a connection, like, you know what I'm saying? Right. So we went to his, you know, his crib in Ravenswood, then we chilled, and we went to Queensbridge, walking around chilling, and that was it. We just got cool that day, you know what I'm saying? And we started making songs immediately, and um, we just clicked. Immediately, we just clicked, you know what I mean? We became really close friends and getting into mad trouble together and just doing all this dope music, and everything was just, like, so he was making beats. He knew how to make beats immediately, or nah, nah. Um, I actually taught half how to how to uh, make beats, how to sample. And wait, uh, you, you were the initial yeah, yeah. beat person. Yeah. What were you using? <laughs> uh, EPS sixteen yeah, plus, Sonic, yeah. Tascam, four track, set four track yeah. shit, recorded shit. Like you know what I'm saying? Led the little mix board. Um, yeah, so. After I met Hav, you know what I mean, and we started getting real cool, and we started being like, all right, this is this is we got something, you know what I'm saying? We we kind of look good together. We the same height, we got the same <laughs> style, like you know what I mean? And it's like uh, we making these dope. We made like 50 songs immediately. We made like 50 songs when we first met. In a week or in a month yeah, in about, or about a couple weeks, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and uh, you know, right after that, um. You know, we just realized, like, damn, we got something here. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we just started pushing forward with it. Like, man, you know what? Fuck school. Let's do this. You was that before uh, you did the um, the Too Young record? 
on Nah, was this, is, this is after I did that. So okay. I did the Too Young record while I was in junior high school. Oh, wow. Wait, um, the boys in the hood sounds right? The yeah. high five joint, that was him. As yeah. time wait, 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 what? I'm wait. going with the Swift this G. See, this, is, this is why I wrote a book, man. It's so much, it's like, it's so much shit from different angles. Like, yeah, that was him. But the EPA won't listen to what, what I, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> wait, what? Yeah, that was him. <laughs> Yo, know, these two are the biggest biggest R and B heads of all time. So the fact that <laughs> shit, I, when, when I was living in Left Rack, I had made a, uh, I, I had a, a, a solo career. I was like trying to be, a, you know, a solo artist. My name was the Golden Child. My name was Lord T, the Golden Child. You know what I'm saying? Because my family they call me Chaka. You know what I'm saying with a T, but the T is silent. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? The T come from Chaka. You know what I'm saying? Lord T, the Golden Child. I thought I was the Golden Child. That was my like my favorite movie when I was little. So anyway, I had Lord T the Golden Child. One of my homies from Left Rack, you know, we used to you know, make some music together, or whatever, whatever. But he used to send me some beats, and I used to go record them. And uh, I used to shop around. Cause my pop, my mom's was like, "Yo, shop your demo around." Uh, she was like, "Write your lyrics out, mail it to yourself. That's the cheap man copyright. That's the copyright man, right. poor yeah. man copyright." Like, <laughs> so I was doing. My mom's was teaching me what to do. She was like, "Do this, do that. Take your shit around. You know what I mean?" And so. We got my music to Jive uh, somehow. I don't even remember how. But Jive gave me a demo deal. And a demo deal is... They Who's said, the a &R there? Do you remember? Nah, I don't even remember. Was it the High Five the Connection? at that time. And this is 1990, but, correct? Nah, this is like 88, 89. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So I'm in Jive working in Battery Studio. You know, they got their own yeah. studio. Yeah. So they gave me a studio. They was like, all right, let's see what you can do. You that's, by that, yourself? That's what a demo deal is. You right. know what I'm saying? <laughs> they put you in the studio. All right, let's see what you could If you could come up with something dope within the next couple of months, we'll sign you to yeah, a real deal. deal. You know what I'm saying? So that's the kind of deal I had. So, so I, you by yourself? Me by myself. With the drum machine and you writing your rhymes, doing your own music? No, nah, I, I I wasn't making beats at that point. Okay. I was getting beats from people and, you know what I mean, just trying whatever I could do. So uh, while I'm there, I used to... I used to flirt with the girls at the front desk. Like, you know what I mean? A couple of girls that worked at the front desk. Yep. You know, they, they was cool with me. So one day I'll go to job to go to the studio, and the girl at the front desk, her name was Kim. I remember her name because she hooked it up for me. <laughs> she was like, yo, I want to bring you to the back. You need to meet somebody. They working on the soundtrack. I'm going to get you on this soundtrack. Come on. So she brought me in the back office. She was like, yo, this is this is Lil T, whatever, da, 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 da. He rapped. You should get him on this song. So they was like, all right, go ahead. You know, write, write some bars. Let's see what you could come up with. And I wrote that too young. You know what I mean? And they put me on the song. So crazy. Yo. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally thinking about that song last week. All the stuff about um about Trump, you know, uh defunding the EPA and all that. I'm, right, right. That lyric kept coming in my head. It's uh, you know, <laughs> crazy. crazy. Yeah, so I never knew that. Then uh, you know, my first year of high school, um, met half. Still working at Battery at this time. So mm -hmm. I used to bring Hav with me. I was like, yo, I got a studio we could work at. So I used to bring Hav with me to Battery. We used to get beat. We used to, like, use recording pause mm -hmm. on the tape deck. Pause tapes. And make our own beats. And that's we made a lot of beats like that. And um, Were y'all going by the uh, Poetical Prophets at this time? Was that yeah, we still didn't figure out a name yet okay. at this time. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know... Jive gave me that studio. They know I'm not supposed to be having other people in it. So, Yo, does this story sound familiar? <laughs> Very familiar. <laughs> this, is the, this is the black version of MMC yeah. Search right here. This is how so, third base got started. So check this out. So now, you know, Jive was like, all right, we want to sign you after the Boys in the Hood shit and all that. And I was like, look, I got a partner now. I was like, if you want to sign me, you got to sign him. And they was like, oh, nah, we, we just want you. You know what I mean? Uh, we don't want your partner. And I was like, all right, well. See you later. You walked away from that? Uh, <laughs> Damn. <hell yeah. laughs> That's well, loyal. Hey, I was like, man, listen. Because what we were doing, it was, just a, it was just a vibe. You could just feel it. You know what I mean? You could feel the power of what. And we just, like, met and just started. And through our conversations and just hanging out and the music we was doing, you, you could just feel, like, this is what it's supposed to be. You know, I'm not supposed to be a solo artist. You know what I'm saying? Right. Did Havoc know that you walked away? Yeah, yeah, you know that because I was trying to get both of us signed the job. You know what I'm saying? But they was like, nah. So did like I mean by this time, 
there were other groups that were of your age or I mean y'all look mad young, at least on the juvenile hell record. Yeah. Y'all look young as shit. So I thought y'all were in the kids group realm. Right. So were they trying to mold y'all into that ABC uh crisscross kind of bandwagon? Like were Man, they trying the, to make y'all kids group? The ill part about it is we never had anybody telling us to do anything. No A and R, no ever. Like I said, they put me in that room like, all right, let's see what you can do. That's crazy. So nobody ever No told artist me, development, no. Nobody you ever put a said, do this, said... do that. Nobody ever told us what so to do. So you have to we teach yourself all the yeah, We just did it. Like, you know what I'm saying? We just did it. And, um, you know, um, after Job was like, nah, I was like, all right, we out of here. And uh, we just continued to make songs and shop our demo around and, you know, try to get on. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's when we met Q-Tip after a while. You know what I'm saying? All right. I'm sure you, you've you told this story a gajillion times. Yeah. But can you please tell that Def Jam story? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> For our listeners who so have not heard, this is the illest story I've ever heard. Ever. Yeah, man. And then let, let me say something real quick, too. Okay. Let me get something clear real quick. A lot of motherfuckers, they... We read my book or they hear these stories. They be like, oh, this nigga dry snitching. Now, let me tell you something, right? There's nobody being convicted, arrested, or anything for what I'm saying. I'm saying shit with a, I'm saying shit with a, uh, what do you call it? The, the, uh, the uh, statute of limitations. Statue of limitations is done already. Right. So it's like, this is our life. Like, this is shit that happened in our life. And we, it's, it's a blessing that we're able to talk about it right now and that we made it out of certain shit. And, True indeed. You know what I mean? So when, when when you hear people saying all this, they don't know what the fuck they talking about, dog. Like, that, that's, that shit really pisses me off. But anyway, I'm going to tell you the story. <clears throat> um, Thank you. So after the job shit, me and Hat started making mad songs and then we took our new demo around. And what we used to do is look on the back of albums to our favorite labels. So our favorite label, of course, was Def Jam at that time. So we used to be like, all right, where's Def Jam? All right, here's the address. All right, come on, let's cut out of school. Let's take the train, go down to Def Jam. So we used to go down to Def Jam with the headphones, walk men, and we used to just stand outside the door like this and wait for the rappers to come out, you know what I mean, or whoever to come out. And uh, we seen, you know, a bunch of different rappers come out. We used to be like, yo, listen to our demo tape. And they was like, come on, man, I got time for this who shit. Who would you watch, see? Watch who, out, shorty. Who in front of you all? Who's the Amir? Who's the, who's the Amir of the story? <laughs> I just started on three cats last week. Now I feel bad. I'm like, yo, they're gonna be big as shit. Like, we was outside of Thirty Rock waiting for you. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, it was. I'm gonna. I remember clearly who it was. We'll see. But I don't got no personal shit against them. I don't care about that shit. This is like. But it definitely was the Afros. Remember the Afros? Wow. <laughs> wow. Kicking Afro <laughs> left. Yeah. Damn, yeah. Hurricane. Yeah, Hurricane. Yeah. You could have had team. Mom D. Yeah. Hurricane was like, what? Come on, watch out, shorty. You ain't got time for this shit. So I'm like, ah, word, all right, all right, whatever. So we wait outside. We wait outside. We see people coming out. Nobody would give us a listen. The Q-tip came out the building. And, you know, they was on fire at that time. That was, the, you know, trial called Quest to shit. We like, oh, shit. It's tip right here. Yo, could you listen to our demo, son? Like, check us out, son. We from Queens, da 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 He like, oh, work. Let me check your shit out. Put on listen. Played him a couple songs. He took it off. He was like, come on. Come inside the office with me. Damn. Wrote, wrote us in the office. Introduced us to Chris Lighty. Introduced us to... Man, it was called uh, Russ Associated Labels. R.E.L. Yeah. At that time. You know what I mean? R.E.L. Yeah. It was like a management. Management thing and plus the Associated Label thing. And, um... Uh, you know, introduce us to people in the office, and Tip was like, yo, these dudes are dope. Help them. You know what I'm saying? He was like, help them. Get them. Do something with them. So he was like the first up. to really... Yeah, he like, yo, set up. He's telling Chris, he's telling everybody in the office, yo, set up a meeting with, with Russell. Set up a meeting with Leo. Get them, you know what I mean? Get these kids' music heard. They dope, yo. So after that, you know, we uh we had a meeting with... uh They set up a meeting for, for us with Russell Simmons. <clears throat> So we go to the office to have a meeting with Russell. And uh, it's supposed to be at Russell Crib, which was around the corner on Broadway by right. McDonald's, somewhere down that area. So um, we get to Russell Crib. Matter of fact, I had the gun on me. You know what I mean? The little one-shot derringer I had bought at school. You know what I mean? So I, ain't, I wasn't trying to get cut. Um, I had left it in the 
Def Jam office because I didn't want to bring a gun in Russell's house. Right. You know what I mean? I was like trying to be respectful. Respectful. Of his... I was like, I don't want to bring no weapon in his crib. Let me. I was told my man, officer, hold us in the drawer for me until we get back from the meeting. So he's like, all right. He put it in the drawer, walked around the corner, went to Russell's crib. Russell was a no show. They like, oh, uh, Russell got, got caught up. Y'all gonna meet with Leo instead in the office. Everyone has a Leo story. <laughs> so we like, all right, bet. So we go back to Def Jam. We meet with Leo. We play Leo our music. He, he listening. Then he stops the music. He like, I can't do nothing with y'all. We like, why? He like, hey, how old are y'all? So we, we like 15, 16 at this time. He like, y'all, first of all, y'all look like y'all nine years old or something. <laughs> y'all cursing like sailors. Y'all talking about criminal, crazy shit. He said, I'm going to get sued. They're going to sue Def Jam for putting this on the radio and doing all this, that, and the third. Like, there's no way I could get this played on the radio. There's no way I could get this. They're going to ban y'all. <laughs> That's what he basically <laughs> told us. Like, he's like, I can't do nothing with y'all. I'm sorry. And we like. That's crazy. We like, what? We was like, what the fuck is wrong with this dude? Like, he, he didn't understand the music. He didn't, I, I don't know. He didn't get it. He didn't like it. That's his choice, whatever. So we was like, all right, fuck it. We wasn't mad at anything. We was a little upset, like, oh, fuck this nigga, he don't know, but right. we, were, we didn't give a fuck. We was like, all right, on to the next label. We're going to go to it. We're going we gonna to finally find some place. So we go downstairs, and uh, before we leave, you know, they had all these posters hanging up in, in the office in mm -hmm. REL. They had, like, the Great Adventures of Slick Rick framed. They had, like, Big Daddy Kane shit, everybody shit framed in it. And uh, De La had just dropped uh, De La Soul was dead. Right. So I wanted one of those posters. They had the ill De La Soul is Dead post. I wanted to hang it up in my room. You know, that was that back in the day shit. Right. Hanging shit up in your room and whatnot. So I told my man that held the gun for me in the drawer. I was like, yo, get us some posters before we bounce. You know what I'm saying? He was like, oh, all right, I'm going to hook y'all up. So he went, got us some posters. So me and Hav is at his desk. So I'm like, oh, shit, the gun is in the drawer, son. So Hav, get the gun out of the drawer. Then he points it at me. I'm like, yo, chill, son. That shit got, you know what I mean? That shit got bullets. And he's like, I'm just playing with you, my nigga. I ain't. He's like, I'm just playing. Calm down. I'm like, chill, don't point guns at people, my nigga. Chill. So then my man come back with all the posters. He like, yo, here. He put the posters down. Then had pointed the gun at him. Uh... Like, yo, give me them posters, nigga. <laughs> Bam! Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> By mistake. Uh, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yo. They got to go. They got to go. Uh, Yo. You think? <laughs> My nigga. Everything went in slow motion after that. Uh, uh, literally. Uh, get literally. These niggas. Everything, <laughs> everything turned misty and went slow motion. <laughs> I remember literally, like, I don't know why that happens, but I guess in the heat of moments like that, shit just Time slows just time, slow. yo. Right. So, half drops the gun. Like, he, we both like, oh, shit, what the fuck? Like, we in shock. You know what I mean? Have bolts out the, bolts out the door. Runs downstairs. Like, oh, shit, I'm out. So I'm like, oh, you're not leaving me in here. I started chasing, <laughs> I started chasing behind him. Like, in the office. Wait, my dumb ass want to know, did you at least take the poster? Because that day I saw a poster was rare as shit. <laughs> nah. Man, you got the nah, I wasn't even thinking about no more when we posted at that point. I'm like, you know how hard that this shit on eBay right now is like a nothing. No, he was trying man. to get low. He was trying to get the fuck out of there at that point. So, Hav ran out the door. Knocked DMC down. The DMC and running was coming in the building. Knocked them niggas. One of them niggas fell on the floor. I don't remember who was going. Because he busted. He like ran out and busted through the door. So, one of them fell down. We ran up. We running up the block. And I hear That's somebody, a crazy way to meet Run DMC, yeah. by the way. <laughs> I hear somebody screaming behind me. Stop them kids. Yo, stop them kids. So I'm like, I look, and it's fucking Ali Shahi is chasing <laughs> us. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> oh, God. So he's chasing <sighs> us, yo. Oh, he keeps chasing he's us, yo. <laughs> I'm like, yo, this motherfucker is chasing <laughs> us, yo. <laughs> so we get down to Houston. Right? We get down the house and have stop have his wild like, yo, son, it was a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. It was a mistake. I'm like, yo, calm down. Calm down, my nigga. Everything gonna be all right. Just chill. Relax. He's wilding though. He's like hysterical because he didn't mean to do that shit. Like, you know what right. I'm saying? So he's wilding. I'm trying to get him to calm down. And I see a D, I see a detective car pull up, unmarked car. You know, we know what the D's look like. 
So I seen the D's. I said, oh, I said, yo, Hav, chill, chill, chill. The D's is there. Because Hav is screaming, like, I ain't mean to shoot him. I ain't mean to shoot him. Oh, mistake. Oh. So I'm like, yo, chill, 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 chill. So the D's is right here. Chill, my nigga. So they see him bugging. So they stop the car. They get out. They're like, yo, what's, what's going on? He's like, yo, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. I'm like, oh, my God. Here come Ali Shaheed. Yo, get the... Da, 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 da. They put the handcuffs on half. Because half is sitting there basically confessing. He's like, I didn't mean to do it. It was a mistake. Da, da. They're like, oh, no, it's going to be all right. Put your hands behind your back. Oh, uh, Lord. I'm like, oh, my God, man. So they let me and my man Prince AD, that was our DJ at the time, they let us go. Took half. I go home, go to sleep, right? Wake up the next morning to go to school. My mom's always got WBLS playing on the um, clock radio in the morning. So I hear on the radio, they like, uh, yesterday there was a shooting in Def Jam office uh, over contracts. The artists, oh. some artists, uh, they wouldn't sign the artists, so the artists shot somebody in the office. Oh. That's what they said on the radio. So I'm sitting there listening to it. I ain't even tell my mom. Is your mom putting two and two together? Nah, like... she don't even know what's going on. So when I heard that, I was like, I was like, oh my god. So now like reality is hitting me because I'm just waking up and I'm like, it's a new day. Right now I'm like, reality is hitting me. What just happened yesterday? So now my brain kicks in the, how are we gonna get out of this mode? You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, all right. And right away I just came up with a story. All right, we thought it was a lighter. <laughs> No. Because you, know you know how in the village, yeah. like downtown, they got the little lighters at the smoke shops, little, yeah. little gun lighters. Rizel used to carry that shit. So I'm like, yo, in my mind, I'm like, all right, we got to think of something quick. So right away, I'm like, yo, we thought we found it outside. We thought it was a lighter. We was playing with it, and shit went off. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I had to go to the hospital, kick it with the homie. They got hit, and, um, you know, let them know. Like, listen, man, you know that was an accident, man. You know what I'm saying? You got to stick to this story. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. otherwise, it's, it's going to be bad for half. Like, so he, right. was like, he was like, all right. You know what I'm saying? He looked out. You know what I'm saying? He was like, because he know it, it, was a mis- it, it was a terrible mistake, but. Where'd the bullet go? Man, his stomach. Abdomen. Oh, oh man. So, yeah, that, that, that craziness happened. So, and, um, y'all did not get signed to Def Jam, I presume. <laughs> nah, and then, uh. Like, you know, have you like, talked band. to Run DMZ or nah. Ali about this, like, later? Like, nah, but Nikki D, remember. That's the girl. Because she was there. She used that to work day. at the office, right? Yeah. Oh. And after that, she would always remind me. But she would always remind me about that day. Every time I seen her after that. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, yo, y'all little niggas is bugged the fuck out, yo. What's wrong with y'all? The cat got shot. He survived. Like, he, yeah, he's cool. Yeah, he, he was right, good, cool. man. You know, fortunately... You know, everything worked out. and um, That's a crazy story he'll tell for the rest of his life. Too. It's definitely a crazy story, though, man. After, after that, Def Jam had security. You couldn't even walk in the building anymore. Before I was going to say, because when I went in. to Def Jam, it was like freaking... What not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how long is it till 4th and Broadway comes in, in the uh, the picture? 4th and Broadway uh, is a company, or is a record company on Island Def Jam. You know, um, Eric B. Rockem. Yeah, used to be Eric B. Rockem's label. So right after that, we, uh, you know, after everything with that Def Jam shit, we, uh, we, you know, we continued to make demos and just Q Tip had brought us like into the industry. So we started meeting different people and finding out. We started finding out about industry parties. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because they would tell us, "Oh, there's a party over here tonight. Party over here tonight." So we started being in the loop of all the industry parties at that point. Uh, talent shows. Kid Capri would do these talent shows. Uh, whoever got the best verse or song, you get $100. We won one of those one night. Um, we were just going around, different functions, New York City talent shows, different party, industry parties. And our homie from uh, high school, Derek, that put us together, my, my, and that kid that was in my photography class, mm-hmm. his mom used to work for WBLS, and she was, like, cool with Puff. So he arranged a meeting with us and Puff. So we, we got real cool with Puff right away. Um, and Puff would invite us to all his parties. He was That's when he was a club promoter at that time, heavy, mm-hmm. doing club promotion. And uh, we used to go to all the, the, the Puff parties, you know what I mean, at the building, the red zone. So we started really being at all the functions and hanging out, and people started knowing us, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Maddie C got a hold of our demo. 
Mad as from the source. Yeah. He got a hold of our demo and he put us in the um, unsigned hype column that he did. And because of the unsigned hype column and uh, Maddie C's other homeboy, Bones Malone, yep. they was like they found interest in us from that and they was like, yo, we want to have a meeting with y'all. Bones brought us up there, Maddie, and we met Cookie Gonzalez and uh, we met uh, uh, Chris Blackwell. You know what I mean? Ah. So they brought us in to meet Chris. We sat down with Chris. Uh, Chris was an interesting dude. Yeah, what was that like? Because Chris is like... <laughs> yeah, that was very interesting. He was sitting there rolling up some hash. And I ain't, I've never seen hash before. Right. He had a big, like, roll of black hash. And I'm like, yo, what is that? He's like, yo, it's hash. You smoke it. So I'm like, all right. He's like, you want to try it? I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> so we smoking hash with Chris Blackwell in the office. He's like, yo, I really like y'all, man. I want to sign y'all to, you know what I mean, do a deal with y'all. Did he ever interject? I've, I've never met... Chris Blackwell, without at least him interjecting a Bob Marley story. I'm sure he did. Of his glory, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he did, especially when we were smoking. You know what I mean? He probably said something like that. Um, but at this time, you know, they had Rock Him, Eric B. and Rock Him. Before, not at this time, but they had in the past mm -hmm. Eric B. and Rock Him. And the the newer, uh, more updated artists on Fourth and Broadway. They have X Clan? Was, was uh, MOP. You know okay. what I mean? They had a song called The Hill That's Real. Uh, and how about some hardcore? That was, hardcore. Right. That was on Fourth and Bro at, at this time when Chris is signing us. Right. So he offered us a deal. He was like, "Hell yeah, we want that. We taking it." You know what I mean? So we did the deal with Allen, and um, yeah, basically it was the same thing. He ain't tried to tell us what to do. They basically just no A and R, no. I mean, Cookie and Bones was like, you know, but Bones that's dope. <laughs> know us. Bones know us. Like, he started right. hanging out with us and seeing how we are. So he like, yeah, just leave. let them niggas do them. They know what they doing. And they know what they want. Like, you know what I mean? How old are you then at this point? We like 16. We like, you so you still mean? in school? Are you going to school still? And yeah, we in high school. But at this point, it's like I'm about to drop out. Because now I'm to, one day I'm like sleeping in the crib. My mom's waking me up like, come on, you're going to be late for school. I woke up. I said, Mom, I'm not going to school no more. And how did she take that? She was like, oh, word? She was like, okay. What? And then she left and went Damn. to work. Where's that mom at? Mom and mom then when she came back from work and she thought about it, she said, son, are you going to pay some rent? Or? She just, she was just like, okay. Because oh, wow. she, I guess she seen what I was doing like, okay. with my career. You know what I mean? She was helping me. Like, do it. Like, you, you didn't have any resistance in your family. Nah, not with like, you know, I come from an entertainment family. So they like, they was encouraging me. And the family me. trait. Right, yeah. but it's still hip hop, so you know it's so different. It's definitely they... different. So they, my mom was scared. She okay. was like apprehensive when Chris wanted to sign us, and he, he actually did some kind of thing where we didn't need our parents' consent. Wow, <laughs> wait, and that pissed my mom's off. Yeah. She was like, "Oh, that, that he's a piece of shit. He did say he went around our backs and signed y'all without our consent." Nah, nah, nah. But we was like, "Mom, chill, man." You know what I'm saying? So the new edition story ain't happening, y'all. Y'all was straight. My mom used to manage us, too. Okay. You know what I'm so saying? So then how did they go behind her? That's crazy. She At this time, she, she was, was, like, managing us for a minute, and then we fired her. Cause <laughs> how do you fire your mom, man? Y'all hardcore. Because she was like, you know, we did a talent show, right? before Right before we got signed up for and Roby, we did a talent show. It was like a New York City, some talent show New York used to do all the time. And we we had, we had those like auditions, rehearsals, or whatever it is, and we'd go through our song, and our song got curses in it. The chorus of the song go, "Oh shit, here we go, yo, oh shit, here we go." That's the whole chorus. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we put it on, we like doing our shit, and they like, "Oh, stop the music, stop." The they was like, "Yo, you can't curse in this talent show." We like what? They like you can't curse. You you have Fuck to uh, change about. the curses or do a new song. We like what? We're not changing nothing, man. We're not doing this, man. Fuck your show. And we we walked over. My mom was like, "What's wrong with y'all?" So she sat us down. Like right after that, she was like, "You can't do that. You can't you can't disrespect people like that. You just change, take the curses out." We was like, "Yo, listen. We gonna stick to what we do. You know what I mean? We don't want nobody trying to change us. Uh, we was hard headed, like you know what I mean. Wait, havoc, I, I mean, havoc, Proj. I, I gotta say, three times I've heard you easily walk away from some shit that could sort of maybe sort of change your life. What I've never heard nihilism to this level, where it's just like, Psh, I'm out. I can walk away. What is it in you? Like, what's in your head that just be like? 
All right, I walk away. I think we just, we believed in what we were doing so much. Like like I said, it was like the, the vibe that we had. We could just feel it. It was going to work, and nothing was going to stop it. It was just a feeling. You know what I'm saying? Like, we was like, oh, we got some shit. He don't know it. She don't know it. None of these people don't know what they talking about. You know what I'm saying? That's just we crazy. We got some shit. Because usually people, <laughs> by this point, people will either have a side meeting. Okay, maybe we can meet him at the 50-yard line. Let's compromise a little bit. You know what they want. And then, you know. Now, nah, we were really there. we were really hard-headed. You were just like, oh. We were really, um, we were really just stuck on what we were doing. We were tunnel vision. We wasn't trying to hear nobody. We We had... A, a something that didn't really exist like you know what i'm saying it was like the vibe that we had the, the, the you know just the the energy and the words and the, the style the slang everything was just it wasn't nothing like that you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and um it was just like a changing of the guard at that time almost because you know it was like you had the rock hymns and the big daddy canes and the, you know the, the symphonies like when the symphony came out like that was what was popping when we was learning how to do rap Mm -hmm. And then once we started getting in the studio, we started catching on to how this shit works. And we was like, oh, we got this shit. Like, we know how to do this shit, right? We thought we did. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But it just it just made our minds like, oh, this is, we on some new shit. We a new generation. These motherfuckers don't know what they talking about. We got some shit. We not trying to hear nobody, yo. So that was- No it, clean version. Yeah, it was a fucked up attitude to have, but- <laughs> No, I mean, you stick to your guns. You know what I'm saying? You stick to your guns. So my mom was like, yo, you can't do that. So we was like, yo, listen, if, you, if you're not going to follow what we're saying and believe in us to the maximum and fuck everybody else, then we, we can't work with you no more. <laughs> to the mom. And you're 16. And she was like, she was like, all right. She was like, all right, cool. I'll see right, you when cool. I get at home. She was, like, but that's, <laughs> she was like, that's a very bad attitude to have. You know what I mean? That's a very bad attitude to have. You're not going to get far in life with that attitude. She... She gave me the whole spiel of that whole thing, but we wasn't trying to hear it. So it's like when you fire your moms, what happens when you get home? Like, is it just normal? Like, dinner time. All right, so what's for dinner? Mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> now you make your own dinner. I mean, at that time, I wasn't. I was kind of. I wasn't going home anymore. Mm -hmm. I was kind of at the out the house already. Okay, you know what I'm saying I would stay at half crib, or I would stay at my grandmother's crib. I would pop up at my mom's crib sometimes. Like, we were just bouncing everywhere. I was staying. In the, in the Bronx with my homie from school, stay in Brooklyn with my homie Illa G from school. Um, you know what I mean? We were just everywhere, man. We was young, active, trying to get on. Like, you know what I mean? I wasn't thinking about, I didn't want to be in the house with my mom. I was like, you know what I'm saying? I'm right. out of here. We going to Coney Island. We popping. We stay in the weekend. We was just having fun and doing what we doing and creating ourself. You know what I mean? And uh, So we, even even though Juvenile, did, Juvenile Hell didn't necessarily do the numbers i mean it did get you guys so notice amongst industry people so check this out our arrogant asshole attitude mm -hmm. right <laughs> that's why that album came out like and underperformed and it was like not really we didn't put our heart and soul we didn't put our we didn't understand that this shit is not a joke like, you can't just do whatever and, and people supposed to kiss your ass and like it. You got to make timeless. You got to make some shit that stand the test of time. And we didn't understand that. We was very arrogant. We was very, you know, cocky on some bullshit. And that's why that product came out. And then a couple of months later, Nas dropped Illmatic. Uh, and that, that brought us to, down to reality. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> now, have you, have you met Nas before? Like, oh, yeah. Y'all we were in the same, like, we how's y'all? on the block together. We all trying to get on right, at the Q same time. Too. You know what I mean? Mm. We all trying to get on. Nas had live at the barbecue. He had uh, the song on the Zebra soundtrack, the halftime. Zebra, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, dude, this is all at the same time. While we doing Juvenile Hell, Nas had the Zebra halftime shit and... You know what I mean? And then we go off on a little promo run, mm -hmm. and we in a, we doing an in store one day in D.C. We doing an in store for Juvenile Hell, and we walk into the in store, and Illmatic is playing. We never heard it before, so we listen. We sitting there like this. We uh, and have look at each other like, you hear this shit? We like, oh shit, yo. Uh, pack this shit up, yo. <laughs> man, we, pack this studio. <laughs> we was like, yo, pack this shit up, man. We we went about this all wrong. You know what I'm saying? And that brought us 
down to reality, basically. That gave us that was a reality. That's a good thing. Cause yeah. That was a reality. Did you call check your mother? You <laughs> <laughs> was right, man. You might have had a point, right? You know what I mean? But um Bitch, you guessed it. You know, right right then. We seen it, we seen it before before we even got dropped. We already knew, oh, all right, we fucked up. You know what I'm saying? Because we could hear the difference. We could hear it. It was a big difference between the, you know, the thought that was put into making the music. You know what right. I'm saying? The thought that was put into making writing the lyrics, making the beats. He put some serious thought into that, and we didn't. We were just fucking around being little dumbass kids, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, feeling ourselves, yeah, we got a rap deal. Yeah, I got gold tooth. Yeah, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so how far, like, when did it suddenly become, like, okay, this serious business? So uh, we got Because a lot of people still feel as though that's your first record. When we got dropped, that's when... When we heard the Illmatic album, and then we got dropped maybe like a couple of weeks later or whatever, whatever... We was just like in the sunken place. <laughs> we was like, we gotta get the fuck out of here. Yo, we gotta. We was like, no, no, this can't happen, yo. So we you thought like, no. we make a second album and then yeah, write the wrong like, and yo, our hearts was broken. You know what I'm saying? Because we was like, yo, this is what we want to do with our life. Right. We're not playing with this shit. We just went about it the wrong way. We had the wrong attitude. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No. Like we was like, no. You know what I'm saying? Like we gotta we gotta show people who we are. We gotta tell our story the right way. We gotta put like I said, put thought and and, and put meaning, put your soul, put your heart into the music. Like, you know what I mean? Tell your story, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? So we were just we went in and we had that attitude, like, yo, listen, this is what we wanna do for our the rest of our life. We just got dropped. We feel like the biggest losers ever. We go into the hood, everybody laughing on us on the low end. Nas just dropped Illmatic. These niggas, these niggas is just some corny. Nas, Nas looking at us like, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like they laughing at us on the low. So we we like went in, regrouped, and we had the attitude like you know we not we not going to this ain't going to happen again. You know what I'm saying? One thousand percent for sure. This is never going to happen again. You know what I'm saying? And so did you have the the the? Well, I know that at at that point, uh, Matt started working at Loud, correct? Uh, yeah, right right around that time, Matt got a job at Loud. Uh, Loud, they was just like a cubicle inside the RCA office. Right. Okay. They had uh, PMD, I think his first solo yeah, album. Yeah, the first one. Yeah. They had the Alcoholics, and they had just signed Wu Tang. Wu Tang. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, uh, we had we we regrouped. After that, with that mentality, we was like, oh, hell no. That's when we really started going in, making our own beats. That's when I like, I was teaching half, you know what I mean? During that time, with Juvenile Hell, and transitioning over to making this new demo, I was teaching half how to do the beats and shit, and he was getting nice with it. So at first, it was like, I would make a bass line or some, some drums or something, and then have a come add some shit to it, you know what I mean? And I'd be like, yo, yo, let me add, let me add something, let me change something. They be like, oh yeah, all right, let me ask. So that's how it was at first. After a while, I started listening and looking. Have started looking possessed, my <laughs> nigga. Mm -hmm. Like you could just see it. He was fucking possessed. Like, you know what I'm saying? And you could hear it. So I'm like, after a while, I was like, I don't even want to bother him. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't want to be like, yo, let me add. Because he was in his groove. Like you know what I'm saying? So right, I was like, his own thing. Let me just let him work. You know what I'm saying? And. I'll just sit here and write the rhyme. You know what I'm saying? So it got like that. And plus, he was hogging it a little something, too. He was definitely <laughs> hogging the machine. You know what I'm saying? Right. He was like, hold up, hold up, son. Hold up, hold up. You know, I'll be like, yo, come on. Let me add you. Like, hold up, hold up, hold up. After a while, I'm like, all right, yeah, go ahead, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to go to the store and get a 40. I'll be right back. Come back. The beat is done. <laughs> and then I just write around to it. But then I also seen that have, I seen Havoc become Havoc. I seen it. You know right. what I mean? I seen it in his face. I heard it in the music. I just seen the look in his face when he was sitting there making the beats. I was like, wow, he's really, he's really tapped in right now. Like, you know what I'm saying? So that's how that happened. And um, you know, Maddie brought us over to Steve. You he heard our demos. He was like, yo, y'all motherfuckers, I got some shit now. I got a new job over here. I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring you up to the office, meet Steve Rifkin, blah, blah, blah. Steve, he played music for Steve. Steve was like, yo, I love it. He's like, I want to sign y'all. You know what I'm saying? 
But at the same time, we hanging out with Puff every day. So Puff is telling us about this new company that he wants to start called Bad Boy. And he's like, yo, I want I want y'all to be the first artist. I want to sign y'all to Bad Boy, da 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 Whoa. So we like, we hanging with Puff every night, you know what I'm saying, at the clubs. He like, he want to sign us. Steve want to sign us. So we now, we're now we telling them, all right, let's get some paperwork. Get That's some paperwork. why he's in the videos. I was wondering why he was in those videos in the yeah. beginning. Oh, yeah. Okay, I get it. Put this so, all um, up in the video. <laughs> Dance. <laughs> so, so basically, <clears throat> the deal that Steve offered us basically was more money. And that's the only reason why we took the Steve. But what was the trade-off? Like, Because um, usually with those things, more money but less control, power, and something. Nah, it was... It was it wasn't. It wasn't actually any trade off. I guess it was a bit the trade off was um, the trade off was they probably got to keep the publishing. We got to keep the publishing. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. They got like, to keep plus their we publishing. Didn't, we didn't, plus right. Maybe the trade off was also we didn't have to do all the glossy right. Right. other shit. Like you know what I'm saying? That was one good trade off. Like you know what I mean? But Puff no had a vision. Back. He had a vision for this company, and he wanted us to be the first artist on Bad Boy, but. Steve just so happened to offer us maybe like ten thousand dollars more mm-hmm. than what Puff was offering, so we we just went with the Steve deal. Plus, Steve was talking like, "Yo, listen, I I'll give you all this deal. You just do what y'all want. It's, it sound like you already got y'all game mastered. Just do what y'all do. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we took the uh, loud deal, and um, you know, we started working on the the infamous album. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, shout out to Maddie C. You know, shout out to Bones Malone, you know, Cookie Gonzalez and, you know, Chris Blackwell and everybody that helped us out in the beginning and got us to that point, you know what I mean, where Steve Richman wanted to sign us. How did Q-Tip come back into the fold uh, working working with y'all on the Infamous? Um, so after we, uh, you know, it was like 80% probably done, maybe 60% done maybe mm-hmm. with the album, we was like, yo, let's call Tip. We want some beats. We want some beats from Tip. So... We reached out to Tip. Uh, he came and picked us up, and he brought us his crib on Linden. And uh, he was just, basically he just played us mad records. He was like, "Tell me when you hear something you like." You know what I mean? So he would play us mad Patrice Russian. He would play us all kind of shit that we. So I think it was the Patrice Russian one with the LL, the LL did the song "Pink Cookies in the Plastic Bag." Right. Oh, that was uh, uh, Esther Williams. Esther Williams. It's all, all right. right with me. Yeah. So. Uh, so uh, he plays us that record. And right away, I, I recognized it from LL's song. Mm-hmm. But in my mind, I was like, yo, let's make a new, let's make a different version. Let's use that beat and make a different and version. use it the like, right way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Shots fired. yeah, we, we, we picked a bunch of beats from him, and we did some songs, and basically we finished the album up. And when the album was done, we brought Q-Tip back in the studio to tweak up the mixes like you know what I'm saying like cause he was nice with that like you know what I'm saying fix the sounds here and there do little things here and there touch the knobs and shit you know what I'm saying and he basically like took what we did and like made it sound good like you know what I'm saying hooked us up with the good mix engineers you know what I'm saying so that was that was really good that we was able to work with him at that point you know what I'm saying Where you're listening to Questlove Supreme. We're here with Prodigy of Mob Deep and Kathy Iandali, journalist and co-author of Prodigy's latest book, Commissary Kitchen, my infamous prison cookbook. Um, okay, I have to say that, you know, the the glory of hip-hop and being alive during the classic, during the Renaissance and the classic period and, the, and all the periods of hip-hop is, you know, when a song stops you, in your tracks, yeah. shook ones was definitely. I, yeah. Yo, I will say, and the thing is, I don't think anyone has really properly put in context why shook ones is so culturally important. All right, take it, take for someone sheltered, yeah. someone sheltered like me that like just listen to hip hop to really find out what's going out there. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm one of the, I'm one of the dudes that the the marketing people of Def Jam would have loved because like when Onyx came out, I was like, yo, this is real hardcore. <laughs> or like when Niggas for Life came out, that was like, yo, you were NWA saying this is so. But I didn't realize that it was so over the top hardcore. It was, it was cartoonish. Yeah, <laughs> it was cartoonish. And when I heard Shook Ones, they did. I f- I feel like. If if Robert De Niro 
and Al Pacino were making hip hop. <laughs> That's what it would be. <laughs> well, because the glory in, in Robert De Niro and Al Pacino's work is the fact that they're so deadpan. The subtlety, yeah. Yeah, it's deadpan. You're more scared of someone that's silent and just deadpan as opposed to like someone's cartoon and over the top, then I don't take them serious. I'm like, oh, your your bark's worse than your bite. You're just being a cartoon. But the fact that they were saying the shit they were saying and so, so deadpan about it. Yeah. And too, it was the visuals too. Like the visual, like that video. See, I didn't like, see the video until later. So I heard the song. It was just like, yo, how for me, this- I saw for we saw the video first. I saw the video first. And so for us, it was it was seeing the video and literally probably about a month after the video came out, I remember kids in my school, come my homies, had the Hennessy jerseys. Right. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> Straight up. But yeah, it was yeah, something yeah. it was just something that came through in that video that was like, I mean, being in the South, even though y'all were New York guys, there was just something I don't know, there was just a that level was, of that authenticity. Was New York, that was new but that was more New York to me than any Wu Tang product, any like to me, even 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 on L, uh, even on New York, New York, where like if you listen to the the very uh, the first twenty seconds mm-hmm. with uh, Dog Pound's New York, New York, I mean they're basically mocking, right? Mopping, Yo, what up, done? Yo, what up? Yo, what up <laughs> you know, like so. Like kid. <laughs> for me, that's like lightning in a bottle. You can't even capture like. I guess the theme of Quest Love Supreme is that whenever like these these monumentous hip hop moments happen, it's always an afterthought. Like, yeah, we made that shit in like five minutes. <laughs> like, Word. what was the process behind Shook Ones at, or at that part two? Well, it was part, yeah, because it was part one first. I had the magic yeah. single with part one on mm-hmm. it. Yeah, um, like uh, why wasn't that push? And um, I don't know. It just it just happened the way it happened. I don't even know, man. We made part one and uh. I think we made we might have made both of them around the same time, and then we put the part one out first, put the second one out, and uh, yeah, it just, like, it were just, you shocked, it just happened like that. Were man. you shocked that at at it's the reception and you know every time we would make songs, we this is how we would test our music. We'd be outside on the block with everybody, you know what I'm saying? Um, Queensbridge is. Like I said, 96 billion is, is big. It's a big project. It's a lot of people outside. Like we got a lot of friends. Like you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you know Brooklyn, hanging out in Brooklyn, the Bronx, same thing. We would hang out with all our friends and we would play our music and we want to see how people react to it. Like you know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? We and we got you know our peers, people like Nas spitting crazy. You know what I mean? People like. Cormega was spitting crazy. Like, it, it was a lot of people that was dope. The whole Juice Crew thing, the symphony, like, that, that was, like, shit that we, that was around us. So it was like, you know, we was trying to spit that level of shit. These are the people that we got to deal with. Mm-hmm. These are people that are going to laugh at us if we make some bullshit. Like, right. you know what I mean? If we talking some bullshit, if we talking some shit that's not true. Like, you know what I'm saying? If we, like, we had to deal with people. Like, you know what I'm saying? And so... That's how we would test a lot of our music. We would play it outside on the block, see how people react to it. And we would see how friends, our friends would be like, yo, shit's fire, yo, bring that shit back, yo, bring that shit back. And we would walk around different blocks in the hood and just, like I said, take it to Brooklyn, take it here, take it there, see how everybody feeling it, and that's how we would know, oh, we got something. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. If motherfuckers didn't react, and we'd be like, yeah, we can't fuck with that. But if they reacted, we knew we had something. So we did the same thing with Shook Ones. You know, most of the songs was like that. You know what I mean? We would test it out on the block and, and see how people would react. And then we would be like, all right, we got one. Put that out. You know what I'm saying? I think another part of the formula that really made that album work is the fact that the musical backdrop it was like so. It <laughs> wasn't as hardcore. Like, even for like Up North Trip, like I remember my uncle used to always, that, that came from a, a Spinners record, Spinners 8. So he used to always play. The spinner's uh, I'm Tired of Living on his 8-track. Yeah. Right, so that's how I always remembered it. But now it's like, I mean, even though the subject matter of that song was more like a, it's kind of like a fuck my friends, like I can only trust me sort of thing. But like, I always had happy memories of being in my Uncle Junie's car listening to that song. But then like, y'all just took it and just made it into like. Yeah, it was like a juxtaposition most- of like smooth, like, soothing sounds and then like the most murderous shit 
on top of it, <laughs> like lyrically. Even yeah. like with Drink Away the Pain, a record like Drink Away the Pain, like that's like a happy ass head on the song. But then, right, then y'all slow it down and like spit that shit over it. Yeah, it man. becomes something we, totally we was, different. You know, we caught we caught our drift. We caught a drift. We was on it, like you know what I mean. And once we locked in, that was it. We wasn't. We was like, all right, we got it. We got it. Let's go. And like you know what I'm saying, we. We getting the reaction that we want from people now. So what, what is I'm life saying? like now that the album is taking off? I mean, y'all got four and a half mics in the stores. I'm I'm one of those people that actually believe that four and a half mics is That's better a than a five. Because when you when you I mean yeah you you can have a five, but then it becomes a burden. Like I feel like for Nas that five is a burden on him uh. because it's like everybody's always going to say, well, in the beginning in 1994, this is when da da da, and uh. you know they kind of. I feel like four and a half is like the highest accolade you can get where you don't get that much jealousy or, or scrutiny from your peers yeah, or whatever. I see. I definitely see what you Did mean. Did you feel some sort of way? Do you feel like, oh, man, we should have got a five like Illmatic? Or... At that time, we, we didn't really... We didn't really care. Like the source was the source was definitely... Don't get me wrong. That was like the Bible, hip-hop Bible. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. that's how we got our break was from the source. Like, unsigned hype. But, um... That you know what we were making, you know we knew the power of what we was making. Like we felt it, we seen it, we heard it. Like we seen how people were reacting to it. So we didn't really. Once we got in that zone, it was just just go time. We didn't really care, you know what I mean, too much about. Oh, they gave us four mics or whatever, because we still had the attitude a little bit in us. Like you know, <laughs> fuck these niggas, don't they don't care, know what they right. talk about. Like you know what I mean. Okay. But it was a little bit more polished. The attitude was a little bit more polished, but it was still there. You know what I'm saying? It was still there, so we didn't really, we didn't really care too much about anything. Once we got our shit off and running, shook one, survival of the fittest. It was like, phew, we out of here. Fuck everybody now. Let's just do what we do, stick to what we do, stay in the studio, stay working, just keep dropping these fucking albums, keep dropping this music, and it was just like that. That was it. It was over. So now that it's more active for you, as, as far as the reception, and I'm sure the touring has ramped it up, and just the overall activity. How are you able to deal with your health issues and still maintain a, a, a busy, like, itinerary promoting? And I was fucking up bad. I didn't even realize what I was doing to myself because I didn't learn about health and diet until, like, my mid-20s. Like, you know what I'm saying? My look, mid to early to mid-20s, like, you know what I mean? So I was like, I didn't even realize what so I was doing So there wouldn't be times where, like, Right before a show, you might oh, have yeah. an attack, or it's like, fuck, oh, yeah. what do I do? It was plenty of those times because I didn't, re I didn't realize that I was making myself sick. Like, we would get up in the morning and have E and J for breakfast, like you know, oh like, shit, like That's... literally every day, like you know what I'm saying, and have yeah, St. Ives for breakfast, like that was our <laughs> thing. Crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, as crazy as it sounds, that's what we were doing. And why was that? Because a lot of people don't really understand sickle cell like that. So why was that like so bad for you? Um, because I learned later. I didn't know at this time, but I learned later that alcohol um, dehydrates, you know what I mean, your blood. It, de it takes all the oxygen out your blood. It dries up your blood cells. So that uh, when oxygen is missing out of my blood, that's what triggers a sickle cell crisis. Like You know what I'm saying? So you were having a lot back then and didn't yeah, even know. I, I didn't even realize that I'm doing it to myself. I'm thinking because the doctor always told me all my life, you got sickle cells. Nothing you can do about it. You're not going to live past 40. You know what I'm saying? That's what they told me all my life. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing you could do about it. There's no cure. There's, that's it. You so, got to deal with this shit. So do you think a part of the, the, the nihilist kind of I don't give a fuck attitude is just the fact that inside you felt maybe, well, shit, by the time I'm 40, I'm not even going to be here anyway, so let's just... It wasn't so much... I mean, maybe subconsciously that, but I, I, never, I never thought, like, I'm going to die when I'm 40 because that's what they said. But I used to hear that all the time. So maybe subconsciously, yeah, you know what I mean? But definitely the pain that I was going through made me off a little bit. You know what I'm saying? A little bit. What is the I actual probably pain? Need some is help, it a stomach like psychological pain? Help. Um, nah, it's like pain in the blood. It starts It starts like, all right, you know, blood cells around. You know right. what I mean? It look like a lifesaver or whatever. Uh, and, um, when my blood is missing oxygen, when there's not enough oxygen in my blood, my blood cells change shape. And it's turning like crescent moon shapes, sickle shapes. Mm -hmm. And they start interlocking with each other like this. And it causes like chain reaction. 
And when it, when they start interlocking with each other, it just builds up, and I guess creates pressure. Or I don't really. So it's like a headache, or I mean, well, not yeah, a. It's like throbbing. It's like somebody took a hammer or a sledgehammer and just like boom, like you know what I mean. Wherever oh. the pain is at, that's what oh, I'm feeling. Shit. It's like crippling, like you know what I mean. I can't even walk. I can't move. Sometimes my friends had to carry me to the hospital. Like it's crazy. It get crazy. Like so. Um, you know what I mean? I, I've been, I remember the. I can remember being a little baby, laying in the hospital, looking up at my family, looking down at me. I don't even. I probably was like three years old. You know what I'm saying? And I can. I, I remember those memories, just laying in the hospital, looking up at my family, being sick in the hospital. I ain't understand what was going on. I just know I'm in pain. I don't know what the fuck is happening. So this pain been with me all my life, and it definitely, you know, had an effect on, you know, my mentality and. Made me angry. I ain't believe in God. You know what I mean? Because I used to pray to make Why would God you suffer and make make the pain go away, and, and it's not going away. So I was like, "Oh, it ain't no God then." Yo, you know what I'm saying? Here's a. Yeah. This might be a dumb non-celebrity question, but did you ever? Were you ever in the same room with like T. Boss? Because I feel like y'all would have some of the same issues since y'all Damn. both were on tour a lot, and she seemed like she really went through it a lot. Yeah, we had a conversation. We were gonna do a song on my H and I C album, but uh, she said her label wouldn't let her do a song. Was that the You Can Never Feel My Pain joint? Yeah, she was supposed yeah. to get on that with me. I had made that song for me and her, and uh, I went down. I flew down to Atlanta, and for her to hear it, she came to the studio and uh, she liked it. She was like, "My label's not gonna let me do it because they're not gonna let me get on a hardcore rap song." Yeah. So I don't know, what the, you Damn. know what I mean? But uh, yeah, the Sickle Cell was crazy. It was a crazy thing to grow up with, and. You know, it definitely you made me angry. You know what I mean? I was an angry, pissed off kid. And then my father, you know, he didn't help all the shit he was teaching me. And you know what I'm saying? So, you know, by the time I got to high school and they had, I was just, oh, it was, I was insane. I was an insane kid. Like, you know what I'm saying? I was very fucking insane, man. And, uh, you know, going on tour, I didn't realize I was killing myself. Like, I, I would, we, we would get off the plane. I'm sick. I got to go right to the hospital. Can't even do it. Got to cancel the show. I have got to perform by itself. This is when Infamous, you know what I mean? When Infamous came out, we was like right. touring overseas immediately when Shook Ones and all that. And, uh, you know, I had, get sick. I had got sick in Paris. I had to go to the hospital in Paris. I had to go, you know, different places overseas. And, you know, I just thought it was normal because this is what I did all my life. You know what I mean? Get sick, go to the hospital, get better after a couple weeks. <clears throat> Right. Come out. But when it started affecting the shows, it started affecting the money and people booking us and you know what I mean? Did that uh, affect your relationship with 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 uh Havoc? Nah. I mean not where not he would really, be like Nah. Like would he be on you like, yo man, like you you know if you do this, da 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 nah, nah, that's gonna mess up the money or you yeah, know. Yeah, he didn't know. He okay. didn't know. We just thought I you know I got sick of cell, I get sick. Okay. We didn't. Re- I didn't realize you didn't connect. It's because of my diet and right. all this drinking, all this smoking, all this. We didn't know that. You know what I mean? So we just think I'm. I'm P gets sick all the time. Okay. I-, I hope he doesn't get sick tonight. I hope he doesn't get. You know what I mean? So after a while, or the money getting fucked up and promoters scared to book us, that started making me think different. Like, all right, hold up. This is fucking up the business. I keep getting sick. What's going on? So you know, I started doing research and. I started finding out that, like, you know, uh, you could control the sickle cell just, you know, from having a proper diet. It's all about diet and what you put into your body. And and uh, also, also your, like, your spirit, your mentality, like, because once you change your mind and your spirit, it, it kind of has a domino effect. Everything has a domino effect. Once you start making change in your life, mm-hmm. little things, whether it's diet or whether it's spirituality, once you start making changes, everything else you look. You start looking at other things. Like, Hold up. All right. Well, I eat clean now. I eat vegetables. All right. So what else do I need to clean up in my life? Like you know what I mean? Oh, I need right. to stop this. Or I need to stop hanging out with with these people. They, you know what I mean? They get me in trouble. Or I need to stop thinking like this. I need to start having negative thoughts. So it's like a domino effect. So is, it, is it easy to do that? I mean, for, well, we didn't even get into how you guys went from poor, uh, political profits to mob deep. <laughs> but even the first time I met y'all, I don't know if you remember like. The, you guys did an in store, or maybe y'all were just there. I don't know. Um, when do you want more? Our our second album came out in Philadelphia at Tower Records. Uh, we were we did an in store, like played inside of uh, 
the side of that store and you guys were there and I was kind of shocked. I was like, cause you know, even then for us, I, I guess people sort of looked at us like alternative rap. The like they they yeah. <laughs> kind of didn't accept us into the fold until like way later, but I was shocked. I was like, damn, Mob Deep's here. Like, damn. Okay. Maybe, maybe we're doing good. Like I know that you guys <laughs> were in town at night to do right. power 99 the night before, but I also noticed that y'all rolled, humongous like big like how how do you if you decide okay maybe i need to break away like how do you separate yourself from church and state if you will i mean i mean you know it's it's very tricky man it's very tricky navigating through that whole lifestyle and through that whole like you know what i mean uh communities that we grew up in like you know what i mean it's it's not easy, man. You know what I'm saying? Like on an average tour, how many people were rolling with y'all? Um, now or back no, then? No, back then. <laughs> um, back then. Back then. If we was in the states, maybe like 15, 20. Maybe it could be more. Sometimes if sometimes we would drive to like Connecticut or drive to Boston or something, and we have like fifteen cars with us. Ain't that and it'd be like so I gotta people. So I gotta ask. <laughs> nah, because we driving, like you know what I mean. So it's nothing it really. Oh no, sleeping. Okay. So I gotta ask because eight of us sleeping in a room, like you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so when when Drop a Gem on him came out, and I first heard that on a mixtape. I mean, that was like at the not even at the height, but at the beginning of what would soon become a very unnecessary you know fabled talked about uh east west rivalry thing which you guys were like caught dead in the middle what was what was your reaction because i i know i mean in hindsight i know that tupac was just basically like just calling out any and every name i mean even De La Soul and the Fugees got. <laughs> I was like, "What are they? What, what they didn't what did they to do about it?" Right. right, exactly. So I know they were just calling out. He was just calling out any and everyone. But when you first heard, when you first heard hit him up, like, what was your reaction? Your feeling? Like, did y'all ever have a relationship with Tupac before? Nah, we never. We never met Pac. We've been in the same room a few times, but right. we didn't we didn't have any connection. We didn't know each other, like you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so so when uh you know when the hit 'em up shit came out, we was like, oh shit, a word. So immediately, you know, I'm already thinking like, oh, he's standing up for Snoop, cause we just made a song going back at Snoop, and Pac is the brand new artist on on Death Row. Oh, I forgot about New York. Okay, you know what I'm saying? I get it. I get it. Pac is the brand new artist on Death Row, so he feel like he got to show y'all what I'm. I'm Death Row now. Look, watch out, Snoop. You know what I'm saying? Like I'll handle these niggas for you. Right. I'm the new artist. Let me. This is my job to do this. You know what I'm saying? So that's how Pac mentality was. I think. You know what I mean? He was like, "Fuck that." He got to show and prove to Death Row. He's gonna hold it down. You know what I'm saying? So he went at us for Snoop. That's what I think. You know what I mean? And also, a lot of people say that uh, on an album on, on Survival, one of our homies, Havoc's cousin, he says in the chorus, Thug Life, we still living it. Thug Life, we still living it. Yeah. Like, on the chorus. Yeah. Um, we wasn't dissing Pac. That was just like a slang in the street. Like, the Thug Life. You know, oh, Pac, I, I never even Pac probably thought. Coined, right, yeah. <laughs> Pac probably coined the phrase. Right. But it, it was a slang. Beforehand. You, you know adapted it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what, how we was talking. Like, you know what I mean? So... I heard that Pac took offense to that. You know what I mean? Because we were saying thug life, you still living it. You know what I mean? So not knowing you just adapting what he yeah, so, pioneered. Yeah, it I, wasn't. I no, it. We wasn't even taking no shots. Right. So with drop drop a gym on him, it's like, you know, for for most East Coast rappers, going to L.A. is like, yo, that's some fun shit. I mean, at least for now, <laughs> now that the smoke is clear. <laughs> you know what I mean? But. Not back then. Yeah, like how I mean, to, just to be caught up in that shit. Were you guys like very cautious in coming to Los Angeles for fear of like some shit might go down, or was it just like, um, when uh when the L A L A and New York New York came out, and then Pac dropped hit him up. Um, I saw L A L A was number one on L A radio. You know what I'm saying? Mm. For whatever reason. We had a big fan base in Cali early. You know what I'm saying? So 
we had fans out there and the song became number one on LA radio and they was requesting for us to fly out there and perform it. So we would fly into LA. We would bring like all our boys with us, you know what I'm saying? And we would go perform this song. And we had the mentality like, you know, yeah, we war ready. We're going to bring our niggas with us. Something pop off, we're going to pop off. Like, you know what I'm saying? That was our mentality. Like, you know what I'm saying? And we was out there performing that shit. You know what I mean? In the middle of all that. Damn. So I'm glad nothing escalated. You know? Yeah, because, you know, it can get bad anywhere. LA's bad. New York is bad. Like, everybody bad. Like, you know what I mean? So it could have got nasty. You know what I mean? But, you know, it is what it is, man. Like, that's, I'm just saying how it went down. Like, you know what I mean? We True. were performing out there. The LA LA record. And it felt weird, but we did it. It felt like, yeah, we was in danger, but we didn't give a fuck because we in danger back home too. You know what I mean? When we hang out at the clubs, we hanging in the hood, our friends is getting shot. So what's the difference? Right. <laughs> That's how, that was our attitude. Like, you know what I mean? What's the difference? I don't give a fuck. Let's go perform. Like, I happened to read the source article uh, for your solo project. When you were explaining that, you know, the whole Snoop crust the buildings line or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I got the perspective you were coming from saying, like, basically, like, we out here on the front lines, you know, we're out here repping where we came from and that sort of thing. Right. So it's just the, the, the whole takeover situation, like, in hindsight, I mean, how do you feel, like, have you guys spoken since or is it just like... Is it water under the bridge now, or? Yeah, it's basically, you know, water under the bridge. Of course, we still we still got that little, you know, competition <laughs> in us. Like, we still be looking at it like, yeah, and then, like, you know, Jay don't really fuck with nobody. He don't do songs with nobody, like, barely. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when Jay did the joint with Fabulous. I was like, oh, shit, he did the joint with Fab, yo. Right. That's dope, you know what I'm saying? I was happy for Fab when that happened, but, you know, Jay don't do songs with nobody, so it was like... Well, that, I know that him and Nas sort of, you know... And, People basically see take over as a as a Nas Jay Z situation. Yeah. So but, let, let me let me let me let me start from the top, right? Right. I was already thinking when I first heard Jay say that line. I was in a club in Queens, and it was, it was all my boys, and I heard the song Money Cash Holes was playing in the club. I was like, oh, this is dope. That beat is crazy with the piano shit, right? Right. So I heard the line. I was like, because you know we listen to. We like really be scrutinizing rap. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? We yeah. be like, what he just said? You know what I'm saying? Who he talk about? Like, what? <laughs> what? You know what I mean? We be overanalyzing shit. Like, so when I heard that shit, I was like, huh? I caught that shit right away. I was like, New York been Snoop ever since Snoop came through and cried. I was like, what the fuck is he talking about? So, you know, the thought just went past my head. So I ain't think nothing of it really after that. And um, I was in the office one day at Loud. And Pun was there, Fat Joe was there. And I was just kicking in the office chilling, and I overheard Fat Joe said, yo, you heard that line? He was talking to somebody. Yo, you heard that line Jay said in New York? Been so I was like, words, son, I feel the same way, my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yo, that's crazy you said that, son. I feel the same way, yo. He's like, word, that's kind of crazy he said that. So, you know, um, when we were doing the Source, I did the Source interview, and I was like, man, Jay-Z a bitch-ass nigga for saying that. Like, how you gonna say that? Like, you know what I mean? That was some bitch-ass nigga shit to say that. Like, come on, man. Cut it out, man. Like, we was holding it down. We was out there performing. We risking our life. We like, it was serious. Like, you know what I'm saying? And now right. you come years later saying some shit. Like, shut the fuck up. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just rap, nigga. Why are you talking about that? Right. That has nothing to do with you. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just rap, nigga. So I was pissed. And, you know, I was on my bullshit. You know what I'm saying? When I was young, I was on my bullshit. I feel so, it. I said, I said something. I was like, he a bitch ass nigga for saying that. You know what I mean? And um, you know, he he I got the word back from Dame Daz that Dame was like, yo, Jay was you know, Jay said, you know, he he wished you just would have reached out and spoke to him instead of saying it in the magazine. I'm like, man, whatever, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So then uh I had actually had a conversation with Nas, right? Right before this um article. I had a conversation with Nas. And uh, cause uh me me. What's his nigga name? Mm. Memphis Bleak. Memphis, um, Memphis Bleak was taking shots at Nas. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, he was fall, if you fall, I can help you out. Or, he was just saying it's, little slick shit here and yeah, there. It's a line he on was now. like, your life is written. Who you kidding? Some shit like that, whatever. So, you know, I, I took offense to that. Anybody talking about Nas, I'm mm -hmm. taking offense to it. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, everybody, you know, Queensbridge, like, that's the crew. That's, that's our crew. Right. So, 
I talked to Nas one day. I was like, yo, son. I was like, you heard, you heard, you hear these niggas? And he was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, I ain't worried about that shit, though. I was like, yo, son, man, fuck that. Let's go at these niggas, son. What's up? He like, nah, he like, nah, fuck them niggas, B. I'm going to go at them niggas, man. Fuck them niggas. Ain't nobody. I'm like, yo, son, fuck that. Let's go at these niggas. These niggas trying to pop shit, son. You hear this shit? They popping mad shit. He's like, man, fuck, I'm telling you, man, fuck that shit, man. That shit ain't about nothing. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to so just, you him I'm more. Like, yo, I'm gonna just do it by myself then. Fuck it. He was like, all right. <laughs> so then, right. you know, that's when I did the article shit. Said the shit about him, blah, blah, blah. And then he do the Summer Jam shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. he, uh, so how that happened is uh, Irv Gotti is cool with, uh, you know, with Jay. Right. And uh, Ashanti used to go to my grandma's dance school. You know what I'm saying? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And um, and uh, at the time, we had did a song with Vita called Burn. You know, we was like, oh, that was my was shit. Burn. Yeah, she went and got that one. We was like, my favorite mob DJ. We was going at it with Jay. Like, we was going at it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Um, right. I was going at it with Jay. Like, little shit on mixtapes. I wasn't taking it as serious. I wasn't like being like a rapper, like being like, I, I gotta write some bars. Like, right. I was on some writing, like, nigga, when we see you, we're gonna beat you up. We're gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna shoot you in your foot, nigga. You God, God don't remember that shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, that was my mentality. I'm not even thinking, like, I, I gotta write immaculate <laughs> bars. I gotta make an ill like, battle what? rap. Like, I'm not even thinking like that at all. I'm just thinking, like, hey, nigga, we gonna fuck you up. Yeah, that's, that's all that's on my mind. Like, yo, nigga, I'm just writing, like, nigga, I'm angry writing, like, I'm gonna fuck you. Let me see this nigga. <laughs> so, fucking, um, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, um, we did a song with Vita called Burn. Right. And, um, Vita signed, you know, to Irv Gotti. So, it's time to shoot the video for Burn. And, you know, the Burn is getting a lot of. Play Flex is playing the shit out of his record. It, it, it becomes a hit, and we time to shoot the video. We we holla at, and and we get a word from Vita that she can't do the video. So I called her because I was like, me and Vita was kicking it. You know what I'm saying? So I had mm -hmm. a number. I'm called her. I'm like, yo, what's going on? She like, yo, P. Let me tell you. She was like, Irv told me I can't do the video because Jay, you know, was like, yo, don't let her do that. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, they hating on you over there right now. Uh, this, that, and the third. She was like, I can't, I'm sorry, I, I can't do the video. I'm like, were they really did that? She was like, yeah. She was like, they over there, like, you know what I'm saying? They like, don't let her do it. So I'm like, all right, it's cool. I understand. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. So Vita never got in the video with us because of that. Right. So then the whole Summer Jam shit happened, and he puts this picture up, me dressed like Michael Jackson. You know, I thought I was Michael Jackson when I was a little kid. Who didn't think right, so? I was like, we all did. We all right. thought we did. So <laughs> right away, I knew where it came from. Right away, uh, you know, right. Put two you put together. two and two together immediately. Right. I was like, oh wow, he did some real ill other shit. Like he went and got a picture. Like, right. <laughs> he lied on the picture, said it was Prodigy 1989 or some shit. Like you know what I mean? He lied about the year. Um, so whatever. I thought it was funny. You know what I'm saying? That, like my nigga was in in the audience at Summer Jam. My man Ella G. He called me like, yo, P, you not, I told you that picture was going to come back to haunt you. <laughs> G, <laughs> G had seen the pictures years ago and shit when we was, like, working on music. He was right. looking through the books. He's like, oh, shit, look at this shit. So whatever. He's like, yo, I told you that picture would come back to haunt you. I was like, what you talking about? He said, yo, son, Jay just put your picture up at Summer Jam. I'm like, what? So now we dying laughing on the phone, right? So now I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So I'm like, all right, that's what's up. He got jokes. He got jokes. All right, cool. It's funny. You know what I'm saying? And that was that. And then he made, you know, he was going at Nas and and me. Mm -hmm. He was like, as Nas, you don't want it with hoes. So basically he's talking to me. You know what I'm saying? He's like, as Nas, you don't want it with hoes. This, that. I got money stacks bigger than you and all this shit. He talk about me the whole song. You know what I'm saying? Right. He took a little jab at Nas, but he's talking about me the whole song. So um, now I'm like, all right, this is it. Fuck that. <laughs> It's war now. It's on. Like, God right. damn it. You know what I'm saying? Fuck this shit. Fuck this nigga. Fuck everybody they down with. Da, 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 da. So, you know, I was on my shit. And um, Nas dropped Ether. You know what I'm saying? And it just, I was like, whoa. 
he was, took it serious. He took the right. beef and, you know what I'm saying? Making to the, the next song. level. Yeah, I was like, oh, he, I wouldn't have wrote no shit like that. I was too, <laughs> I was too angry. Uh, I was just mad. I wanted to catch this nigga like, and do something to him. Like, you know what I'm saying? Did you ever talk to Nas after he did either about that? Because, like, he changed his mind, and then he changed his mind to a major extent. So yeah. what was he thinking? Was it that he got mad for the attack on you or the mad for the attack oh, on Nas, him? I think, Nas, I think Nas did eat the... Well, he also had to defend his title. Yeah, the, yeah. I think Nas did eat the... And, the song called Build and Destroy. Number one, because Jay mentioned his name. So he like, all right, now fuck that. And plus, we was I, me and Nas was already talking about I was like, yo, let's go at these niggas. Like, you know what I'm saying? But now, I guess he heard that song, and that drew the line. He was like, man, fuck that. So he made a song called Build and Destroy also at that same time, and he shitted on me. Talking about, yo, prodigy get robbed and all this. He was talking about, Nas was saying some things that he doesn't have no idea what really happened. He thinks he knows, but he really doesn't know. So he was something I got robbed to stand third and da, da, da. And at the end of the song, he apologized to me. Like, yo, P, at the you end of the song? Yo, P, I love you, man. Just get away from them fake ass niggas. That's what he say on the song. Like, you know what I'm saying? After he just shitted on me the whole fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, yo, where did this come from? Oh, he hit you like, yo, I got this joint built and destroyed. I about was the... just in the studio with him. Like, I was mad that they was rapping about Nas. I'm like, yo, yo, fuck that. Let's go at these niggas. They rapping about you, son. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And now he got a song dissing me. Right. I'm like, where did this come from? I don't have no beef with Nas. I hate to ask this. What album is that on? Nah, uh, it was on. Was it Stillmatic? Yeah. I think. I think Building Strong was on Stillmatic. Really? I think. Don't, I gotta re-listen. Gotta look so it then up, but, yeah. I found out that Nas was mad at me because I did a song with Core Mega, right? And and, and I didn't when I did the which song which is with one Mega, of my favorite fucking Mob Deep songs uh, on Murder Music, right? Did you know? No, 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 no. It was one of Mega songs. Oh, oh okay. When I did the song with Core Mega. He didn't have a verse on it. It was just a beat. I went, wrote my verse to it. I left. When he puts the song out, he writes his whole verse, this and Nas. Oh. So I didn't know kind that. Kind of a yet. four, three, two, one oh. situation. Yeah. You know or, what I'm saying? I didn't know that. So then I found out later, that's why Nas, he, I guess he thought my verse was about him because he heard, I, that's far from the truth. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't, I never So did no Nas eventually Nas. find out that I guess Cormega from, changed his verse without you even knowing. I guess years later, after me being oh vocal God. about it and talking oh. about it, y'all like, are I mean, bad communicators. That's why, <laughs> it's like... that's why I wrote. That's why I wrote the book because it, it's so the story is so much complex pieces to everything. I want people to understand how everything transpired and how it went down without that communicating. Was, yeah. That was the, one of the main reasons I wrote that book. And plus, I looked at it like this is my youth. I'm a grown man now. That book is my youth. Mm -hmm. That's my youth. That's me growing up. Right. I'm a grown man now. I'm not like that no more. You know what I mean? I was very hard-headed and ignorant and on my bullshit. And I grew up. So I was like, no, you know what? I'm going to write a book. And I'm going to just like, you know, I'm going to explain how I grew up. And I'm going to explain certain situations for people so they can understand why this happened. How did that happen? How did you? You know what I'm saying? Like, it was so many questions. And I'm sure the fans want to know, why is y'all beefing? Why did this? How did this start? What? That was the main reason I wrote this book because I want people to have a clear picture of how it actually went down. Like, so do y'all pick up phones now? Oh yeah, I see Nas every morning. Again, I just seen him recently at New York Fashion Week. We kicked it like you know what I'm saying, and we were talking about doing some new music together. So Absolutely. we cool. I don't got no problem with Nas. We never really had a problem. I was gonna say, how come like a Queensbridge, like just summit meeting album never <laughs> went down? <laughs> Like in my it's head, y'all could have been y'all. It's too many, yeah. It's too many egos. It's too many people. Like just thinking, like Mob Deep, Nas, like Nori, uh, like I, I mean, yeah, like, like eight. Some of the most incredible ass MCs. Yo, one day, um, I was on the phone with Pharrell, and Pharrell was like, um, our first conversation ever. No, actually, our second conversation. We was on the phone. Uh, and he was like, yo, P, I got to ask you something. He was like, what's wrong with y'all? Queensbridge niggas. <laughs> so why don't y'all fucking stick together and just do music, my nigga? What's wrong with y'all niggas, yo? Like, I'm like, yo, son, yeah, I, it just is It is what it is, my nigga. It's just hood shit. Like, that's what happens, man. Everybody don't get along. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody wants to be lovey-dovey and picture-perfect, but it's not like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, What's the uh, what's the deal now with, um? I'm thinking about other Queensbridge cats, like, 
Mega, Nature, Littles, Bars and Hooks. Like, what's what's yeah, the stats they, for all them now? They all doing their thing. You know what I mean? They doing their thing, and, you know, we doing our thing, and that's it just is what it is. Everybody is doing their own separate thing. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hey, I mean, especially for me, I look at it. I went through a lot of shit, you know what I mean? Just, like, being out there, because I'm, like, an outside out there. You know what I'm saying? So... A lot of people treated me like that. They were like, he ain't from the hood. I always had to deal with that attitude a little bit. A lot of people might have been scared to say it or they didn't want to say it, but I could just feel it, you know what I mean? And a lot of people did say it. So it, it kind of turned me off a little bit and made me really want to just do my own thing. Like, I never said I was from Queensbridge. I always said I'm from Hempstead, like, you know what I'm saying? And these, a lot of a lot of different people from Queensbridge would like to, would like to have you think that, I'm a fake queen. Like I, I like I say I'm from Queensbridge. Like P ain't really from the hood. Like I never said I was. Yeah. You just want people to think that. Like you know what I'm saying? Stop right. putting that in people's minds. Like you know what I'm saying? So I had to deal with that attitude all the time with a lot of rappers, a lot of regular people in the hood or whatever, whatever. So it kind of turned me off and made me just like you know what? I kind of I kind of see. My, I'll just do my own shit. Cause I gotta show. It, it, it made me like I have to show you now that I don't care about. Right. None, none of this. I'm my own person. I'm my own entity. Y'all don't control anything I do. Y'all don't scare me. I don't give a fuck if it's from Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queensbridge, Jamaica, Queens, L.A. I don't give a fuck where you from. This is my life. Everybody live their life. And I don't live my life in fear. You know what I'm saying? So it made me back up over everybody. It made me back up over everybody and just want to do my own thing, man. That's why I started doing, you know, my own shit, man. Because I started dealing with a lot of that a lot of that, you know, just just weird shit. People like he not from out here. Mm. You know don't, what I'm saying? don't you think it's ironic that like amongst that all those MCs who look at you like that in that way, it's like now they're raising children who and they're bringing them up in a way that you were brought up in your childhood, like culturally and all this stuff. And I even thought that now with looking at the the video, you doing ballet. I'm like that. Now that we have the context of where that come from, it adds to the dopeness of who you are. Right. And now I look at even a Blue Ivy, and I'm like, that's her. That's She's her, yeah. growing up <laughs> in that environment. <laughs> right. So, do you see that now as clearly? And um, I just think that you know, it's not everybody. Everybody's not a bad person. Like everybody didn't have that attitude. It was only certain particular people. And um, yeah, I mean, it just it just is what it is, man. I'm me, man. You know what I'm saying? And I, I'm the type of person I was trying to get everybody together. And I, you know, I'm, I'm that type of person. I'm like, yo, all right, come on, you gonna rap? We made. Noid and Twin and everybody rap like you know what I'm saying we was like nah you gonna rap nigga and nigga, nigga, Noid like I don't want to sell drugs I don't want to rap like you know what I'm saying he's like no come to the studio with us come on you gonna rap son you know what I'm saying I used to help Noid write his shit you know what I'm saying and we used to all help each other you know what I'm saying and then it was just like you know what I'm saying I, I'm that type of person to try to you know keep the team strong and keep everybody together. I shot a movie for Queensbridge, you know what I mean, called Murder Music. I put everybody's in the movie. Nas, everybody's in that motherfucker. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's the type of person I am, you know what I'm saying? Like, I try to do shit the right way, get it together. And then you got niggas that's haters. They don't want to see that. Like, they like, P ain't even from out here. Why is P doing that? I should be doing they that. They shouldn't matter. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, All right, so you're listening to Questlove Supreme. We're into our last hour of Prodigy of Mob Deep. And Kathy Yandali, journalist and co-author of Prodigy's latest book, Commissary Kitchen, my infamous prison cookbook. So I, f I feel like your journey is probably, you of anyone has had a kind of a parallel journey to that of like Malcolm X, where like you you had your Detroit Red experience. Literally. Detroit Red. <laughs> right. Oh, damn. That's right. <laughs> it didn't even hit me. Yeah, like you, 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 you had your your Malcolm Little Detroit Red experience, and then in two thousand eight, when you had to do your bid, um, you know, you said and that 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 really changed you. Yeah, that just kinda, saved my life. Yeah, ex explain that because what I want to know, and I, I'm trying to ask in a way because I know a lot of people have a tendency, especially in the press, they have a tendency to like fetishize jail <laughs> yeah like or just like people that had experience so tell me what it was like or whatever but i'm i'm personally curious like to be a celebrity going into that environment like what is it what is your first day like when you're when you're going there um all right let me let me just back up a little bit and say because i always think of shit 
I always think about people comments when they you know what I mean hear the podcast or like people right. what, what they say. And a lot of people like to say, like, you know, why is he talking about all this? It's over. It's in the past. Like, right. why you keep saying this? Like, because this is the questions I'm being asked. <laughs> so uh, I have to answer these you, questions. You can preface like, it. All right. You know what I'm saying? No, I just want to make that clear real quick for the listeners to shut all that comment shit down. Like, I'm being asked questions. That's why I'm talking about this. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, right. and um, you know, I wrote a book about my life and my youth. I wrote a book about my youth. And my book, it talks about all these things. And... You know what I mean? That's my past. I'm a grown man now. You know what I'm saying? So I put my I put my youth out there for the people so they could see all the fucked up shit and how I grew up and all the fucked up shit that I did and been through and you know what I mean? All the good shit and what got me to this point. Um, so that's why I did this book. That's why I do these interviews and talk about past things a lot because these are questions that people ask and they want to know the answers to. So going when I got locked up, um, it was the best thing that happened to me because at this time I was dealing with a lot of hatred coming from people, from certain people from Queensbridge, you know what I mean? Certain people from, uh, you know, wherever, wherever, but mostly from Queensbridge, a couple individuals that I had a few problems with that they just didn't like me. You Wait, know can I saying? ask a quick question? So after the infamous, are you still living in the Queensbridge area, or did you like we 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 move probably moved of... we probably moved like around right after infamous came out. You know, I mean, I was living with Hav in Queensbridge for like two years when we was working on the infamous. You know what I'm saying? Right. We would stay at his crib, or we would take the equipment back to Long Island, Hempstead, change the scenery for a little while. Then we'd go back to Queensbridge, like you know what I'm saying. So after the infamous drop, and we was doing the tours and shit, we kind of like. But we would still go back all the time because that's why people was on the block. You know what I mean? And we grew up with the mentality you don't shit on your people. You, okay. You always take care of your people. Like, you know what I mean? You don't run away from problems. You don't run away from anything. You deal with it. You face it. You know what I mean? And you deal with the shit. That's how we grew up. So that's why I was still there in, the, in these communities dealing with my peoples that I grew up with, my peers. Because I'm not the type of person that's going to run away from shit that I got to deal with, like, you know what I'm saying? So right. I, we were just learning how to navigate, uh, being celebrity and all that shit. And so still, it was never awkward going back there, even though you're obviously established as a celebrity rapper? And Nah, because that was just, like, home base. That was, like, the block, you know what I'm saying? We'd go to the block, have fun, like, drink all night. We used to, I used to fall asleep on the bench, wake up in the morning, little kids going to school, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. I'm bent waking up, like, oh, shit, like, you know what I mean? So it's just, like, that was the block. That's why that's why our friends is that we made something monumental mm -hmm. from this block. We created infamous mob deep. We created all this shit. So this is our shit. This is our people. Like this is our home team. So that's how our mentality was. But um, you know, after a while, you know, we deal with a lot of jealousy. People be like, uh, well, Pete Pete coming around here with a jury on. You know, ain't from out here. Right. Oh nigga rapping about my life. Why you rapping about my life? Like, that's what they like to say. Like, you know what I'm saying? You rapping mm -hmm. about my life. Everybody likes to say that. That's so crazy. But anyway, I was dealing with people that didn't grow up with me. Havoc grew up with all these people. You know, all up in Noy, Twin, they grew up with all these niggas. I didn't grow up with these people. You know what I'm saying? So they don't know me. I don't really know them. We figuring out each other. I'm seeing who scared, who not, who's putting pressure on people. Who doing this? I'm like, oh, word, that's how these niggas get down. Like, oh, word, that's how it is out here in the world. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm learning. That's, I'm a kid still. Like, I'm learning as I go. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where we was just dealing with a lot of jealousy and we had to click up. We had to strap up. Like, you know what I mean? It's on. Like, right. we had to strap up. Like, we got beef with niggas that shoot people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, these niggas shoot people. Like, and that's it. So they cut people, shoot people. Like, that's what we was dealing with. So, I'm protecting myself. You know what I mean? I would carry a hammer. I'm not out doing no harm to nobody. You know what I mean? At this point in my life, I'm just protecting myself. So, you know, it just got bad, man. It got to the point where, you know, I started just just losing it, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? So much neg negative thoughts. So much all the time just ready to shoot somebody. Every time I get out of my car and walk into my crib or what, whatever, I'm like, all right, is somebody going to try to run up on my car or be in the bushes or mm -hmm. I'm on point, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
certain shit that we used to do to people back in the days. We was bad kids. Like we was bad growing up in high school. We was. You we feel was, like karma would come back? Yeah, we was foul niggas. We was doing foul shit to people. Like we was robbing people, doing foul, you know, young young shit. Right. So I got the mentality already. Like that's how niggas get down. And I'm not gonna let that happen to me. So I'm, I'm like, you know, carrying guns. I'm dealing with this mentality all the time, and that shit rots your fucking brain and your your spirit. That shit rots. You keep thinking like that and keep living like that and moving like that. It just takes away from your spirit, man. It just makes you a a foul person after a while. Like you know what I mean? Because you dealing with all this negativity and people saying they gonna do this to me when they see me and making threats. And and then I got to stand up for myself. Like, nigga, you ain't doing nothing when you see me. Like, you know what I'm saying? And that's mm-hmm. just what it was. So, unfortunately, this is the, you know, the, the, the crazy life that I was growing up living in. The shit that I had to deal with. And it got to the point where, you know, I was just out of control, man. Smoking mad weed, just drinking heavily. Like, I, was, I already learned that shit fucks up my sickle cell when I do that. But I was so angry. And just wanting to hurt somebody, just always like trigger finger itchy, like ready to show a nigga, like, mm-hmm. don't play with me. Like, I'm I'm just trying, I'm going about my business, doing my music, I'm making my money. Don't come over here playing with my life. You know what I'm saying? Cause you're gonna find out what happens. So this is my mentality every day. And that's just started to, like I said, it started to rot away in my spirit, my brain, and everything was just like, uh, it felt disgusting. And I didn't realize how disgusting it was until I, I got caught with the gun in my car and got locked up and I just started thinking about everything. Like, damn, just just living that life and just not thinking and being young minded and it was just it was just bad. It wasn't good, man. It was I was I was gonna eventually get killed or some or I was gonna kill somebody or hurt out and I would have went to jail. One or the other was definitely gonna happen. That was definitely for sure, one thousand percent gonna happen. Eventually if I didn't go to jail. You know what I'm saying? It was, like, serious. Um, and it's sad to say it's like that. You know what I mean? And I know a lot of people will listen to this interview. Like uh, like I said on the album, like, you know what I mean? Pete think he tough. Pete talking tough. Nah, you real. I don't think it's tough. I nah, think... but I like to address the people that think that so they can hear me say that. So save your little Pete think he tough comment because I'm already ahead of you, dog. I know that's what you're thinking. I, I doubt our nerd you know ass saying? listeners like, will be. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have a bunch of nerds <laughs> listening to our shit. So. Some people, they hear that and they be like, oh, this, you know, this guy think he's talking tough. He's trying to make his, he's trying to portray his life. There's something that's not. I'm just being honest with nah, you. This you is know what, what it was. I really like, thank you, know you for this because the thing is that hip hop really doesn't allow for its figures to come uh, in a kind of a three-dimensional flesh and blood tone. Like, this is the first time I'm really hearing your story. Like, I've known of you for 20-plus years as an artist, and I've read lots of articles, but, you know, I've never, ever known about your life or your experiences. Like, this is the first time I'm really, really, really hearing you as a human being, even speaking complete sentences. So, no, 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 I... I mean, I think the contrary. I think, if anything, you know, it's it's more you really showing a a a, a, a human side to your life journey and your experiences. You know, yeah, I, I was going down a bad a bad road, man, because it was just like shit was escalating, the drama was escalating, the 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 threats, people were making threats to us, right, was escalating, like it was getting really crazy, especially we had the G Unit deal and. The money got even bigger. A lot of people was like, oh, these niggas are stupid. Why they signed a 50? They, now they looking at us like we stupid. They don't even understand that we got a relationship with 50. Like, you know what I'm saying? 50 from Southside. It's like my family. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we got friends in common. You know what I mean? That, right. Like, me and 50 got friends in common. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it was just meant to be. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he got in a position where he was able to put you on, reach back and to some of his favorite artists or whatever. And he was like, Mob Deep, come on. You coming with me. You know what I'm saying? Come on. We was like, hold up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, well, what are we going to get out of this? <laughs> you know what I mean? And he was like, you're going to get this, you're going to get this, you're going to get this. We was like, where do we sign up? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we was like, where do we sign up? It's I was a Queens thing. I was one of, I was one of the people, uh, it's funny, I, I was one of the people like years ago uh, that I wrote a review. It wasn't even a review. I was just on our little website and 
I was talking about the album. I know. And I for know. me, it was I disappointing. Know exactly you know where we going. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> it was, a, I, okay, I was on The Lawn. It was like just oh, the Justice League the lawn. Side. Right. But then the lawn, the lawn. But then it went to OK Player. Okay, nah, and said, so and then shit, you were for the lawn? No, I was just, dude. I'm on my message, but we just talking, whatever. I'm like, man, ain't nobody gonna read this shit. It's like 30 people here, whatever. <laughs> then the shit goes OK Player. Then like two, three days later, it's XXL. Fonte, this is mob. I was like, what the fuck? Are you serious? So then, like a couple years later, it was. I guess it was right before you went in, hey. and like he wrote, he wrote a blog. He was like. You know what I'm saying? He was he was like dissing me back. I was like, okay, well that's <laughs> fuck it. I, I, I never knew your ass. Yeah, like, yeah he, he didn't know what's going right. on. <laughs> so <laughs> so then like that's like four guests in a row. Right. Right. I, 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 like so Salon. <laughs> so so yeah, me, it was launch. Dude, it was Son, it was Twitter. It's, 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 it's gonna go so crazy. Don't get in the elevator with it. <laughs> <laughs> so so and me and you, this is our first time like really talking, talking. Like we met like once. I met you once at Al's crib like yeah, years yeah. ago, but um. But yeah, but we was uh this is the first time we really talked. And so afterwards, um the joint came out and I, then you did the blog and then you went on your in your bid. Nice. So then uh Al was on tour with us for a minute. We was touring um uh, it was LB, Little Brother and uh Evidence was with us and he bought Al with him. And so me and Al on the bus, like we just chopping it up about everything. We just nice. talking whatever. And he was he asked me, but he's like, yo, the the album, like, yo, why you go? I was like, dog, it wasn't that I said, first of all, I did, you know, they were listening back to it, like, at that point. Man. I said it was better, much like phrenology. I think it aged better than it was, than it did. If you know I can saying? critique the, my, the album myself, you know what I'm saying? When I when I read what you had said, it made me think. That shit hit me. I was like, he, he said, we got rich and stop trying. <laughs> Damn, Fonte. <laughs> 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 well, well, let me, let me, when I suggested <laughs> yesterday, when I suggested oh, Prodigy gonna be on the show, <laughs> your first thought was I was like, I was like, Prodigy, uh, I was like, yeah, okay, but but I knew it wasn't gonna be nothing. I mean, you y'all, need prep as if it's real beef. Yeah, you nah, need no prep. Nah, come on. Nah, that but the thing was, man, I was man. just like, it's not yo. like my beef with Q-Tip. <laughs> right? It ain't like that. That that could have been real. But when but, you said, look, when you said that, it made me think. Like, and being being locked up, that shit just made me think about everything. It made me think about life, decisions that we were making, just everything. Because, you know, I'm sitting there without nothing else to do but think. So I'm not just thinking about my whole life and decisions we made, business decisions. And then I read I read that, and I would listen to the album and hear other people talk about, it was mad we signed a G on it. But, that, but you were coming from a different perspective. There was other people that was, like, just mad we signed a G on it. They like, mm -hmm. y'all mobbed. Yo, I was, I was on A Street one day, mm -hmm. and this old black lady, she had to be, like, 70 years old. She seen me. She was like, Prodigy? <laughs> no. I was like, yeah. She was like, yo, why the fuck y'all signed a G on it? I said, oh, shit. That shit shocked the hell out of me. I was like, I was like yo. She was like, y'all mob deep. Y'all supposed to be just mob deep. You don't sign to nobody else. I'm like, yo, it's just a business move. Like, 50 yeah, yeah. to homie. Like, it's a Queens thing. She was like, nah, nah. <laughs> She was upset and I think, about and that I think that's what it was I as thought, a fan. I thought it made sense. For me, because like, I thought he was from Queens. They from Queens. He looking out. I, I got that. I guess just for me at that time as a family, I mean, Grant, this is 10 years ago. You know what I mean? We right. all have grown or whatever since then. But my thing was, because y'all was coming off the um, the free agents joint. Right. And that was my shit. I was like, yo. Actually, we was coming off of... Um... Uh, America's Nightmare. America's Nightmare. Yeah. Was it? Was it? Yeah, yeah, on Jive. Yeah, that's right. It was Jive. That's right. Uh, it was. Because we went from Jive uh, to Jive. Uh, yeah. The yeah. science joint. Yeah. yeah. Got I love that joint. Yeah. And so with that, I was just like, I mean, the stuff that y'all was doing with Alchemist, particularly like you and Alchemist, just the chemistry y'all yeah. had and still have, like with Return of the Mac and shit, I was like, yo, they just do that. I'm like, man. They, so then, so for me, just coming from that perspective where I said that got rich stop trying, I was just like, man, like, to me, it just felt like, like I understood on paper and like business wise why it worked. Right. But just to me, just as a true hardcore fan, I was just like, and man, I right. think they could have just did them. And when I, I thought about it, I was like, you was right. <laughs> wow. Because I'm, I'm sitting there listening to, I, yo, I, I examined that album, that G Unit album we did so much. And what I got out of it is when I, when I was in jail, when I was just like listening to it and listening to it and trying to figure out why people were saying things that they were saying. And I was like, I was like, okay. The first thing that I noticed that it was too much G on it on the album. They was on almost every song. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't realize that while we're oh, making, you're making it, it we were yeah. just having fun. Like, oh shit, yeah, come on, do this. Oh, buck, come on, buck, get on this song. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yo, Banks, get on this one. Like, you know what I'm saying? We're not even thinking. Like, there you go. We just like <laughs> having fun moving. So, but you know, being in jail, sitting there with nothing to do, I'm just like listening, analyzing the album. I'm like, oh, okay, it's too. They on too many songs. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but it was it was too many like beats from like outside of that wasn't really like mall deep sounding beats, you know right. what I mean? But we didn't realize that while we sitting there making it. We was like so caught up on G five with on going on tour with M. We like, you know, we were just living a high life. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we was already used to, you know, having fun, living that life on the road, but now it was just like living that life on steroids. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? With the inner school money now yeah. and the big budget and the private jets and the arenas every night. Like, you know what I mean? So we were just lost, man. Like we we was lost at that point. Like, you know what I mean? And I was officially lost because I'm already I already got the attitude, like, um I gotta defend myself. Like there's mad threats going on. Mm-hmm. So the threats is even higher now because they know we got bread. They know we you know we're 50. I bought a bulletproof truck. I'm like, these niggas, you know what I'm saying? I'm like 50 moving right. I'm about to do the same thing because I'm we getting threats like that. And we kind of got beef with like the same niggas almost. Like, you know what I mean? So it was like, you know, I just wasn't living right. So not living right, plus access to all of that, you know, money and high life. It was just like a recipe for disaster. You know what I'm saying? I was I was gone. I was gone, dog. You know what I mean? Like, I, I was gone. So I had to get locked up. That first that first week or the first day, like, it, is, is the goal just to be under the radar? And do your time or like for people that are notable and and doing time, is there a thing where the judge is like, okay, I know. Cause I know in Tupac's case, he was they gladly threw him in Jim Pop. <laughs> like, all right, you go to Jim Pop. No, no protection. You know what I'm saying? So is it a thing where like what is your goal or what is your thought mentality that first week there? Especially I mean, with your condition, which leads to the book, uh, which when I when I got locked up, when I realized I had to go to jail and serve, you know, three and a half years, and I got locked up, I was like, all right, let me deal with this. I got, I I got to do this time. You know what I'm saying? And I went in there with the attitude, like, you know, I don't want to make friends. I'm, like you said, fly under the radar, do my time, get the fuck out of there, get my shit. And I went in there with the mentality to get my shit together. Because I already knew what my problem was. I already knew what the downfall was as far as, like, the street shit I was going through and my health and mm-hmm. just my spirituality. I, I was My spirit wasn't right. You know what I mean? So I, I went in there with the plans to get my spirit together, get my body together, get my health in order, come, and try to come out a better person. So I really went in there and went to school. with my, I went to school to how, learn myself. How much time did you have to prepare from the time that you're sentenced to the time that you're going in, because I know that um, you, you have a family to take care of and that sort of thing, so it's it, like it was about maybe a few months, like three, four months, maybe. Okay, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, I went in there with the attitude like I'm, I'm going in here to get my shit together. I'm gonna learn. I'm gonna discipline myself as far as diet, as far as uh, you know, um, just spirituality, my my thoughts. You know what I mean? I started reading a lot of books on, you know, your thought patterns. And, you know, if you have negative thoughts, it change it immediately into something positive. And once you practice, when you practice that, it becomes normal. You know what I'm saying? Once mm-hmm. you practice getting rid of the negative thoughts, as soon as you think it, it becomes normal. And just, you know, everything, man, just getting better with myself and just trying to become a better person. And like I said, I was listening to the albums and, Seeing what we did wrong, what we was doing right, I was just analyzing everything. Like, and um, it took me some time to adjust because I was writing blogs and, you know, what I mean, still popping shit and talking crazy shit. But then, after a while, I started being like, oh, okay, I'm going about this all wrong. You know what I'm saying? I gotta, I gotta be more, you know, I gotta be more humble, humbling. Like, you know what I'm saying? Humble myself and calm down. And you know what I'm saying? Um, I was sitting in the day room one day with my one of my young homies in there. His name is Fresh. And we watching BET, and somebody video came on. And I was like, man, that shit is garbage. You like this shit? He was like, yo, P, why you say everything is garbage when you hear it? Like, <laughs> like give people a chance, son. 
He's like, why you don't give nobody a chance? Like, when he said, he said he was dead serious and said it just like that. Now, he made me look at myself. I never thought about that. I was like, I was like, damn, you right. Like, I never, like, I was like, you right. He was like, yo, the dude just trying to get his money, my nigga. Like, everybody, you know, not the same. You, everybody got different tastes. Just let that man get his money. Like, stop shitting on everybody. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it made me, that shit made me, that shit changed me. I was like, oh, shit. I was like, I never thought of it like that. Somebody, nobody ever said that to me before. You know what I'm saying? They were just letting me be me. No one challenged you. Right. They never said, yo, what's wrong with you? Shit, like, why you shut the fuck up? Like, you know what I'm saying? Let that, like let that man get his money. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I was, it made me look at myself. I felt stupid when he said that. You know what I mean? I was like, damn, I had the wrong attitude this whole time. You know what I'm saying? Now, how does, how does someone survive in that system with uh, dietary restrictions? Like, is it possible to be a vegan in jail or a vegetarian? And does the private prison complex even allow for those types of, of foods to for you to even have access to that? Well, every, or do they care? Every prison is different. Okay. Every prison allowed different things in. Every prison, you know, won't allow certain things in. Um, so every prison is different. One will let, you know, uh, a whole chicken in. The other, they won't let you let it in. You know what I mean? It's just so Oh, it depends on what juice little. you have. And yeah, like the packaging, the way it's packaged, the way it's sealed, the color on the packaging. Like every jail is different. It's real specific. You know what I mean? For each individual jail. Some jails you can have CDs. Other jails, you can't have CDs. You only have cassettes. Mm. Some jails, you know what I mean? Cassettes? Like, yeah, they still in got cassettes. In 2009? Yeah, they still got cassettes. In, in certain jails, you can only have cassettes because they... What CDs facilities? Are what CDs, facilities you can, was you can break a CD. Yeah. I was in Mid-State. Okay. I was in Mid-State. How far is that from... It's like uh, four, hour, four hours from here. Okay. Driving up, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, so every every prison is different, the food that they that they serve, you know what I'm saying? And what they allow in the package from your family is all different. So, um, you know, they have a special diet in prison for like kosher, kosher diet or halal diet, you know what I mean? You got to prove that, you know, that's your religion and you got to have a special diet. Sugar? Sugar um, too? Because one of my prisoner friends asked me, were you going to do a book for the folks, to, I mean, for the non-sugar? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know too much about that. But, uh, Side note, uh, for the very few people in this room that know my day manager, Zara, she loves the shit out this boy. Oh, where? Because her, wow. her diet is that fucked up. Oh, wow. Shout out to she's Zara. Like, she's, like, <laughs> wow. she's like, ramen noodles. I like this. Mm. <laughs> like, she saw it as, like, college survival food. I'm like, not quite. Not oh, right. somebody yeah. not, not forced college. to eat the shit. Okay. No, yes. right. Oh, he's yeah. like hipster. That's cute. Zara's, yeah. Zara, no, I mean, she's the type of person that it actually, yes, she looked at him and was like, I'll take this. Oh, this is so cute. Exactly. It's from prison, though. But, uh, yeah, so, so and, and bringing Kathy into this, how are you? Hey. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Forgot she was here. So what, Thanks, Bill. So what? what is the research process in trying these uh, these recipes out that you 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 made in the in the book and and I, I guess the trial and error of it all. Like, how do you even? I guess with very little instru uh, instruments or tools, you know, it's, it it becomes you know creative creativity is, is your is your best instrument. So how do you test these things out to see what works and what doesn't work? Well. There's two like completely different parts of the cookbook. There's the the stuff that that P always cooked, mm -hmm. and then there's the stuff that most people in prison cook. So, you know. So were you allowed special? No, he just chose. Like, see, the thing that's kind of <clears throat> the thing that's pretty interesting about the the commissary kitchen cookbook is everything that was cooked was what you could purchase in commissary, but. You know, P had been through what was it? Five different prisons in three years, because he always had to have an infirmary, hand, like nearby. So you know, he was moved. But I think he spent the longest at Mid State, right? Hey, yep. So, in doing that research, I went through the commissary that was available at Mid State, 
to know what some of those items were. And then... So what's a typical meal? What's a typical breakfast? Well, a typical breakfast um, at Chow is different from... See, because, you know, they would give... Breakfast would be at 6, right? Mm -hmm. Lunch would be at 10. 6 a.m. Yeah. So you got to wake up at 5... <laughs> What was it like? Like quarter to six? It'd be like six thirty. Six thirty. Breakfast and they go to yard at like seven. Yeah, lunch would be at ten. Four o'clock was dinner and you were done. So when you had Jesus Christ. Yeah. So when it came to the commissary, that was the thing that that people used to to fill to fill them up for the rest of the day. Right. So if your family doesn't have a lot of money to fill the commissary. That's where you get those traditional prison meals, like mashing up Cheetos and pouring chili on them, because those are the cheapest things in commissary. Okay. And also, there's um, a, a pound limitation to what like family could mail you as well. And P would um, make most of that um, those deliveries of nothing but canned vegetables, but because they're in a can, they weigh more. So it wasn't like he was able to get like tons of spinach, you know, because he would mostly get spinach delivered like that. But it's by can, so they're cans not are allowed. Yeah, can, yeah. You can have cans, even though I mean the potential of that being a weapon. Or well, you the can you could use the top as a razor. Yeah, as a knife too. No, but, oh, but you can okay. get it taken away. It's so stupid. They won't allow CDs, but you can have a can. <laughs> yeah. can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. Um. Yeah. So you know, in, in going through in going through this book, you know, when we were going through some of the recipes that he actually made. Um, there was just this whole other part that you know I feel is like this this voyage to culture of people wanting to know about those kinds of traditional prison meals and in doing that research and, and seeing some of those things. And the thing that I thought was really important about putting it in the book was, you know, on P's first day, he had food poisoning because one of the inmates wanted to make him a welcome meal, which was one of those traditional prison dishes. But P's stomach obviously wasn't trained to that. It's like going to Mexico and drinking the water, right. you know? <laughs> what meal was it prison, for our listeners out there? Prison Surprise, which is um, Jack Mac mashed up Cheetos to make a cheese sauce, mm -hmm. poured over like ramen, right? Mm -hmm. It was something like that. And um, and by the end of the night, he had an IV in his arm. <laughs> so because, you know, he wasn't used to eating. And I mean, the I thing is... I woke up sweating bullets, throwing up. I, it fucked me up, yeah. Yeah, and, and you learn about certain things in doing this research uh, where, like, for example, they only give you fruit punch and iced tea but if you want water, they give you an empty jug and you have to go get it. So it's like if you want to lead a healthy lifestyle, you have to actively pursue it in prison. So there's there's also, you know, there's this um, there's prison tea that uh, a lot of inmates drink, which is just simply a ramen packet in uh, water. And the average ramen packet has like 7,500 milligrams of, sugar, of uh, sodium. sodium yeah. So you're drinking oh, like that. Like bouillon, salt water. That's, yeah. That's prison tea? It's called prison tea. <laughs> and how are you able to... How are you able to cook the food on your own in your cell like are you allowed no there was a there's a common area where there's um, a microwave and a toaster oven okay. which is that's why so many of these meals are so simple which is why so many people in dorms would gravitate toward it because of of just the availability of those just two devices and a couple of other things so you know and but in doing the research you you really learn the way the prison system kind of controls the situation and you know, for me, the reason why I, I even, you know, I, I was part of this project was over, over like, you know, the 10, 15 years that I've, I've been a, a rap journalist, I've had this kind of like unique privilege of speaking to a lot of artists right when they get out of prison. Mm -hmm. And I spoke with P, like right when he get, uh, got out. But I also spoke with Boosie. Mm -hmm. And come to find out... Boosie's diabetic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he had also cancer. Oh, shit. So oh, I, that. I believe it was kidney cancer. So, and they blamed it on the lean, but I started to like, you know, you start putting two and two together, how people can enter somewhat healthy and leave like completely a mess. And, you know, in, in talking with P about it, like literally when he got out and he was just telling me these stories and <laughs> I'll never forget, it was one of your guys gave me one of the cassettes that were available in prison. It was uh, Jada Kiss, The Last Kiss, and like a prison oh, wow. catalog. And he's like, yeah, this is what's available. So, you know, I was just like going through the what was available, and I'm like, how can anyone survive on this stuff? So, you know, we were putting this, this together, and you just look at the nutritional information, and then I started to dig even deeper, and you look at what was available in like the U.K. in the 50s. Mm -hmm. A typical prison meal was like prime rib, 
Wow. And like mashed potatoes and glazed carrots. That was like a typical prison meal. I'm not even eating that good now. <laughs> yeah, and, and, <laughs> and you start to you see what happens over the years, and especially as it made its way, you know, to this country, and and like what was available. I mean, even in the past, what was available here was so fundamentally different than what's available now. And you know, when we were touring this book, the biggest prison strike in history was happening. So. It was kind of like this perfect storm, but it, it was also pretty funny because some of the stuff that we were discussing, like we didn't make it too politically heavy, but if you start to read about some of these recipes and what's available and, and all this other stuff, you can kind of put two and two together and be like, oh, you know, I'm trying to kill you in there, you know? <laughs> well, the book did get banned in some prisons. Well, it got banned it? in uh, California. Because, oh, shit. Yeah, but they said it was because there was a hooch recipe. Like, like who doesn't know how to make hooch at this point? Yeah. But... You know, and I think um, I think there's also parts, uh, you know, especially when it comes to pop culture, the way people like glamorize prison, especially because of Orange is the New Black, and just make it seem like this like cool place for camaraderie. And, and there is some of that in the book, you know, because that some of that is true. But there's also something real. I mean, there's an episode of Orange is the New Black where they um, they use the prison packets for current for like currency so that they could season their mm -hmm. food, but. It's like, yeah, but the sodium, like, you know, or there's a joke that one of the um, inmates um, pretends to be uh, Jewish. She, she converts. Yeah, so she can, yeah. Right. So she can have a kosher meal. But like, because the kosher meal is the only meal that actually has fresh vegetables in it. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's things that they, that they put in there that I think are, it's pretty cool. But if you don't do your research on why those things are even incorporated into those episodes or whatever, you know, you don't, you don't really understand what's going on. So... Uh, yeah, I mean the kosher meals are like amazing in prison, and and the only fresh thing that um that in in, in peace facility you were allowed to have was an apple. Damn, not even celery, like a banana. Some celery sticks. So yeah, and carrot sticks. Until the day that you uh, you raided uh, little puns. Uh, oh yeah, cabinet. We, we raided the CEO, the correction officer's refrigerator. <laughs> little pun. Yeah, he, he they used to call him little pun because he looked like big he looked pun, like, the little guy, he like, like a little version. Like but he would eat the inmates' food. Like he would come in there and he would eat their meals. Like he, why? He would eat the so, yeah. Is there is there someone to be an advocate for better health? There's there's some chefs that I know in California that are now leaving their respective. Uh, I mean, these are like Michelin uh, Michelin level chefs, James Beard chefs that you know kind of felt in a moral way it was immoral for them to. You know, learn fine cuisine and then charge people two thousand dollars to eat it, and so they're going the opposite. They're they're going to the hoods. They're going in like South Central, opening up healthy versions of fast food spots. Mm -hmm. And even Magic Johnson said the reason why he you know opened up on Fridays was because, uh, you know that's one of the few places where you can get a garden salad right. or that sort of thing. Um, Don't nobody get a garden right. salad. Right. Yeah, I'm going to Fridays for the salad. Right. Okay. Not yeah, just Johnny Walker. At least no, no, no. it's an option. <laughs> three, three for all or not. No, but a, wo a woman approached Magic and said, yo, I hope, this is like when he opened up his movie theater. She's like, yo, I really hope you open up a restaurant and bring it to the hood so we can have fresh salads. Because you'll be shocked at the fact that you cannot find, I mean, now that most hood spots are being gentrified, I mean, even with um, the locks, they opened up mm. yeah, a yeah, juice, juice bar, bar in Yonkers. Yeah, styles. You know, giving people their first taste of healthy options. So it's like, you know, for for a lot of for a lot of people, especially like, I mean, the, even the idea of soul food is inaccessible. Inaccessible now, like you go to find Southern cuisine spots. At least in the Northeast. Okay. Not not in North Carolina. I'm about to say that's <laughs> no shortage of that shit. <laughs> no, but I mean soul food right now in, in most hoods are takeout Chinese food. Like when people had the experience of like, oh, collard greens and chicken and grits for dinner, like in the sixties and seventies. Now it's wings. gravy, white yeah, rice and wings for under five bucks. Pink lemonade, IT mix. So it's like <laughs> Margaret. Do you Sorry. <laughs> You were placing an order. <laughs> right. Jumbo cheeseburger special. So after you experience. Four weeks and fries, salt, pepper, ketchup, and hot sauce. All right, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> it's hunger. Yeah. It's about to be lunchtime. I'm just, I'm just asking, do you feel that it's almost necessary that someone advocates uh, 
or speaks to, uh, on the behalf of of getting better conditions because I, I often hear of the conditions in prison being horrible and you know substandard and of course you know you you'll hear these these you know right wing Republicans just being like you know well, it's prison that's, that's what, what they deserve and da, 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 da. but you know it's still like you still got to treat a person human sure. and so like is there any is is, is it is there any step or do you realistically see reality where that could be changed? I, I think it's getting I think it's getting everyone on board, but having, you know, their own reasons for it. Like um, a lot of uh, a lot of right wing Republicans have, you know, hit me in my DMs along with um, crazed mob deep fans. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know kind of trying to challenge me in in this discussion and you know well they're prisoners like you know they can eat whatever whatever and even if you take away like the um the humane aspect of it right, right? someone enters prison healthy they leave with diabetes hypertension you know um, poor liver functions everything right mm -hmm. when they get sick they go to the er you pay for the er so if it's you want to, if way or you don't want to even look at it for anything other than selfish to save you financial money. Right. like reasons, look at that. Look at that at the heart of it. That it's still it's ultimately costing you money for these for people to to get better essentially. So you know, which it's a horrible reason to have to con like, it's a horrible argument to even present. Yeah. But there are some people that that's just some horrible truly... people out there. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, people don't also realize, you know, when when you hear people uh, arguing against the idea of private prison mm -hmm. industry complex, people don't know that um, if you're one of the commissary owners, mm -hmm. there was a web, uh, there was an article I was reading about. I guess one of the CEOs of of bon, I don't know if Bonton is a uh, thing here. It's in Pennsylvania. It's real big. It's like Little Debbie's. Bonton, mm -hmm. it's like these local snack companies, okay. but they are making a killing mm -hmm. being the exclusive mm -hmm. uh, provider of all these high end snacks. And it's almost like I feel, I mean, not even I feel, I almost know that it's like the, the, the cheapest high sodium, high sugar amount, mm -hmm. which keeps you almost. And what's funny is even when you go visit, I just y'all just made me think about something because I've been to way too many prisons in Jersey. Even when you go to visit, they don't even provide like the snacks are the same for as for the visit. Like say you're there and it's right. families, it's kids, and they want to eat something while they're there. You better go to the vending machine and get you a piece yeah. of chocolate or something. Not even like a trail mix, nothing in that <laughs> area. Is it uh, Kathy? Is there not one prison that's worth working on their dietary situation? You know, I, I think um, it, I know that Martha. Sorry, Martha Stewart. Changed her spot in West Virginia, and she still, yeah, yeah. she still. But hers is like a minimum security uh, prison. It, it was a, it's a federal women's prison. I think it was Morgan. Yeah. No, it's not Morgan Thomas. White Virginia. collar. I do know that like she's that. yeah. She still actively sends them uh, fresh vegetables and fruit. And yeah. I know. You, you know what yeah. what um what's going to ultimately happen in my opinion. I mean, I'm seeing some of it that they're they're talking about doing it in New York. I, it's going to take someone trying to do it in such a kitschy way because that's what's going to end up. It's going to become trendy to do it because um, I was reading some articles and they're like, check out the farm to table prison, whatever. And it becomes uh, it's going to have to take that rebranding. Like, yeah, <laughs> like rebranding. We need of, a hipster to hit. Yeah, the it's going to yeah. have to be that, unfortunately, in the same way that you got to like change the argument for Republicans on, on the whole prison system in general. But it's going to have to be something cutesy for them to. When their kids are doing is it, like, wait a minute. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. kind of like the way heroin got rebranded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, yeah. but, you know, the, ju the jump from Oz to Orange is the New Black. Mm -hmm. How one, you know, what took off by making it like, hey, what happens when you put, you know, like it's that chic. kind of, yeah, <laughs> right. So I think, um, I think that's going to be the thing that will will have to do it. Um, you know, it, it's it's not not similar, but um, you know, when people started to advocate for better snacks in offices and schools and all these other all these other things, where those things had to change, but it had to uh, be a, a slow build. It's a harder argument in prison.
Oh, Kathy, are you saying Michelle Obama missed out on that one? Because I just, ooh, like she was supposed to cover that. Are you fucking shot? I'm, no, I'm, I love her. So, <laughs> all praise due to the queen, but right. the clue just went off in my head. Right. Like, she did schools. She didn't neighbor. What about? Well, you know, the thing that Michelle Obama did that I think was wonderful, too, was, um, you know, there's a school in particular. I forget the name. Um, you know, my mom had consulted for them in, in Newark. They had a garden at the top on the roof, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. kids would grow the vegetables. They would pull down the vegetables, and they would cook with the vegetables for their lunches. So she did some amazing things, but that kind of stuff doesn't translate into prison. Right. You know, I mean, I think that the initiative that she did was it was making nutrition fun because that was the problem. Kids weren't having fun with nutrition. Your your Brussels sprouts are gross. Like you know, dip them in chocolate, like whatever, like that. You're making <laughs> <laughs> you're making you're making nutrition fun, but convincing convincing inmates whose families are maybe putting five dollars into their commissary and they finish eating at 4 p.m. and they're starving by eight o'clock and they're hanging out in the common area and all they have is like enough in their commissary for ramen noodles convince them that nutrition is fun because what what happens is it's not the it's not the commissary necessarily that's the problem. It's the quality of the food that they're eating in chow, too. I mean, the sodium levels of some of those things, but also it's expired food sometimes. Oh, you know, wow. they'll leave cans for however long. I mean, there's rat poisoning in certain prisons and some of the food. They found glass, mm. pubic hair. I mean, these are things, like, these are real issues that just the quality of the food alone and what will end up happening is a lot of the inmates just don't want to eat the food. You know, who's going to want to eat that? So it becomes a matter of, all right, well, I'll just eat some chips. There's a lot of artists that I've spoken to who, when they got out of prison, I and even before meeting um, P and hearing that story, I would say, what did you eat? And I got, you know, most of the time just some chips. Like living off, like, free Snacks dose, and shit, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, um, and then I remember... Um, I forget the artist. Was it Thurston Howell the Third who did the prison cooking shows? And he would do this like show where he would like you know mash up all like the the food and he would like make these prison dishes. Mm -hmm. And I was just so fascinated. I'm just like, yeah, I get it. Because if like if someone said to you, okay, every day all you can eat the bag of Cheetos, a bag of Doritos, one of those packets of chili. And a pack of ramen noodles. Of course, by week three... You're going to find a way to remix that yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're trying to deep fry your ramen noodles in the toaster. <laughs> and you're trying to make a burger out of the chili patty. Like, you're going to try to get creative. So, um, and, and that, that chapter that we put in the book... Um, I remember, uh, I remember talking to P about it, and he's like, you know, some of the things we were going over, and he's like, oh, it's fucking disgusting. <laughs> because, like, you know, he... P was one... Like, he just made... A concerted effort to not touch any of that stuff because for him it was like it could it's yeah, life it you know there he can't eat that stuff right so I mean I remember when you know there was like a, a lot of the guys would go and, and they would cook together and um, I remember you know asking P like what was the main thing and he's like no I would just have spinach like if I didn't if there was if I didn't want to cook I would just keep eating canned spinach but you don't even have to wash that off it's like packed with sodium so there's like really no way out if you don't sit and think about it which is why we put this book together because it's like listen I get it you know maybe your commissary is lower than the next guy but there's ways around what you're choosing to buy and how you're choosing to prepare it you know can i ask what was the first thing you ate when you got out <laughs> i went to this korean barbecue spot called wuleo okay downtown in soho korean barbecue it was really good That's man the shit. i thought about it the whole bid <laughs> That's the shit. Every time I sat down and ate chow, I was like, yo, man, if I was home right now, I'd be eating Korean barbecue. Everybody was like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, yo, trust That's me. That's the ultimate. Man. You make it yourself. I was like, yo, you trust me, up. trust me. So as soon as I got out, we drove straight to the restaurant. And I couldn't wait to eat some more of that good food. What's your so, diet and stuff like on the day to day now? Um, you know, I just try to my favorite thing to eat is I try to like grill chicken, um, like Kathy said, a lot of green vegetables. A lot of water, um, brown rice. You know, I try to just eliminate fried foods and red meats. Um, you know, it take it takes time to get to that point. A lot of time and discipline. Some people don't like water. You know, what I mean, it took me about a year or two to really get used to like I could just guzzle water, and I love how it tastes. Before that, I was always craving for a juice or, like, you know what I'm saying, a soda. It, t it takes time to develop and, and discipline your body 
and your mind and your taste buds to, you know, to do the right thing. So, you know, after a while, you know, even before I went to jail, I was, I was already learning that stuff in my 20s, like, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, just being locked up, it made me like, all right, I want to see what happens if I'm on some military discipline shit. I want to see what happens, how my body is going to react, how my mind, how, how, how things are going to be different if I, like, on some military discipline, straight water every day, green vegetable. I wanted to see the outcome of that. So I, I did it. You know what I mean? And because of doing that, I was able to work out. Like, you know, they tell doctors told me all my life I can't work out. I can't do any uh, physical contact or, or strenuous exercise because it triggers your sickle cell. And it's true. Like certain things I do, like if I if if, my, if I'm running around too much and my heart rate start going too fast, I get too hyped, my adrenaline start pumping, it triggers my sickle cell. It can trigger my sickle cell. So, you know, once I once I cleaned out changed my diet and was very, very, very strict with it and with the water, very strict with the with the vegetables and everything. I noticed that I wasn't getting sick. I didn't feel sick at all. I was able to work out, not feel sick. Like, you know what I mean? I was just able to get strong and it felt great. It felt great. I was like, wow, this is ill. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because I was already doing it in the streets. Like I said, I learned, I learned how to do that in my 20s. I kind of fell off. You know what I mean? Right before I went to jail, I started going a little downward spiral. I was going through some bullshit in my life. But, um, you know, I, I was already with that discipline. I had already changed my life for five, six years straight. Uh, no smoking. This is this is uh, from 2000, I mean, excuse me, from 98, 97, 98 to like 2002, something like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 2000, maybe 2003. Um. You know, I was on some strict diet shit. I, I was, like, learning how to heal myself through diet and, and spirituality. So I did that already, and I felt the effects of it. And then I kind of, like I said, I kind of went on a down spiral right before I got locked up. So when I got locked up, I was like, you know what? I want to try what I did. I want to do it to the maximum now. I want to really do this shit now. Like I said, straight military discipline with it. So with spirituality, do you mean like meditating, deep breathing? I mean like just the power of your thoughts. Affirmations, yeah, affirmations. Yeah, like just the power of your thoughts. You know what I'm saying? Negative thoughts. Like if somebody, like especially being in jail, everybody got bad attitude. Nobody wants to be there. Everybody's upset they're in jail. Like right. everybody wakes up in the morning pissed off. Nobody wants, even the, C, even the correction officers are pissed off. They got to work gotta there. They got to be there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so everybody got an attitude in that motherfucker. And... Especially correction officers, they talk to you like, like shut the fuck boy. up, go do this, go do, go go uh, wash the toilets, go do this. like they bossing you around, like they fuck with you. Especially when they first meeting you and getting to know who you are, they fuck with you. They try to press your buttons and see if you, how you react. So, I use that as all right. This is gonna be my training. I'm gonna control my thoughts. As soon as he or anybody gives me a bad attitude, instead of me saying, man, fuck, in my mind, you know, my first thought in my mind used to be, man, fuck this nigga, like, you know what I'm saying? Piece of shit. But then now I started practicing, as soon as that thought pops in my head, change it, be like, you know what? I'll pray for him. You know what I'm saying? Hopefully he'll get his thing together. You know what I mean? He don't know what he's doing. Like, you know what I'm saying? He's just angry. He got work here. So I'll, I'll pray for this person. That's what, And I'll change my thought to that. So I started practicing that in there. And that was like the perfect place to practice that. You know what I'm saying? Because you're dealing with all this tension and, and right. foul shit every day. So I would practice that every day, every day. Practice changing my thoughts. Immediately, as soon as the thought popped in my head, I changed it to something else. And then when I kept doing it. It just it, was, it happened naturally. You know what I mean? I don't have to think about it no more. And through eating right and, you know, thinking different. It changed, like, spirituality, that changes your spirit. Once you start thinking different. You know, you're more at peace. Right. You're more at peace with everybody else and yourself. You know what I'm saying? You you walk peacefully. Like, you carry yourself peacefully. You know what I'm saying? Um, at the same time, you know, I'm who I am. I grew up how I grew up. So it's not like I turned into some soft sucker motherfucker. Mm -hmm. I just know how to control my thoughts now. You're you know an, what I'm saying? You're an evolved it's human refined. being. I was going to say, man. too, man, I hear that in the new record, too. Um, I listened to it on the plane on the way over here. Thanks. And um, shit is dope, man. I can hear, like, just the... the. I don't want to misquote the lyric, but it was one joint in particular you were talking about 
You know, it ain't about black and I don't care if you white. Uh, you know, it ain't about your religion. Right. Like you were just, you know, just kind of speaking tyranny, to tyranny joint. Yeah. yeah, tyranny. Yeah, and you saying I just tyranny. I don't give a fuck about none of that. <laughs> you know race saying? don't matter. Right. That's I mean? yeah. That was it. Your faith don't matter. The enemy is government tyranny. All that other shit don't matter. Like you know what I'm saying. You rich don't matter. You broke don't matter. The enemy they threaten our liberties. All that other shit don't matter. Like you know what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get. Cause they try to like divert our attention with like a lot of racial issues. Now don't get me wrong. There's a lot of racial issues with this country. Like for a long time, but. They magnify that shit on the news, and and they magnify it so much to the point where we think it's more than what it really is. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and if people only knew, we all have a common enemy that's really trying to destroy our spirit and our soul and our, control our life. We actually have a common enemy. It's like, you know what I'm saying? That's what I was trying to get across. The point I was trying to get across on that song. So, um. Yeah, you know, I would practice that in jail, and it just, it changed me, man. That shit felt great. I was like, oh, shit, this is ill. <laughs> I was like, this is a great way to think. Like, I, I'm glad I was doing this. I was like, man, this is great, man. Street meditation. Well, I was like, I should have told you on this shit. Like, you know what I mean? It just well, made me feel better. Yeah, well, I felt better every day as a person, like, you know what I mean? Well, Prodigy, we are going to have to close this show. Unfortunately, we could talk to you forever. I do have one last question. What up, though? Are we going to get one more reunion album out of you and Havoc? We def- me and Havoc are like crack fiends when it comes to hip hop. Like, <laughs> it's like we. That's good like, shit to know. Like, you know, I rock him, but like, I'm a fiend. So you're about That's- to do some. You're, you're, I know that you're going to do. Uh, you're doing a few projects with live musicians. Uh, you're doing your residency at, at Blue Note. Yeah. That's every month? Yeah, we do it once a month there. So how can people find out, like, news about upcoming dates with you and that sort of thing? Um, I always tell people, like, you know, you can always Google. Okay. You know what I mean? Hit up, hit up Google, like, yo. <laughs> are you on Twitter? Or What's Prodigy are you? doing? Yeah, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Prodigy okay. Mob Deep. Okay, Instagram, cool. Prodigy Mob Deep. Um, but, yeah, so we can I, you I, I forget sometimes myself. If you want to know what any of your favorite artists is performing or when a new album is dropping, you could go right on Google and just be like, yo, yep. Mob Deep new album or Prodigy new concert or, you know what I'm saying? Like, And it'll all pop up, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or, or you, you uh, I guess, uh, cleverly released the uh, the Hegelian dialect, dialectic, dialectic yeah. uh, on January 20th. <laughs> which, Inauguration day Which was, yeah, I was going to say <laughs> And that was planned out We did that on purpose I, yeah, I, I, I figured as much um, Oh, and Laia's birthday And your birthday Well, yeah, but Come it's on. all about you, Laia Right, okay, that's Laia Supreme <laughs> Well, Kathy and Prodigy, I thank you very much for thank you uh, Yeah, thank you I don't even think I'll go through the customary what we learn thing Because I think we learned everything lot. at the same time yeah, man, shout out to everybody, too, man. Shout out to always got to do this, man. Shout out to Jay-Z. Shout out to Nas. Shout out to all my niggas, man. You know what I'm saying? So all love. You know, I fuck with y'all niggas, man. This is like, man, I'm a fan of Jay-Z. You know what I'm saying? We went through our shit. I'm a fan. I love Son. He's one of the illest. I learned so much from him watching him do business, how he carry himself. And same with Nas. I learned so much about how he write his songs and make his music, like, you know what I'm saying? It ain't no, ain't no beef, ain't no none of that shit, man. We grown. We are now men. evolved. Yeah, yeah, you evolved. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yo, but you gotta get out the comments. Don't read them comments no more. They get to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. No more comments. I love reading the comments. No, man. No. No. The comments be better than the articles. Sometimes. I love reading the comments. <laughs> Not when they taking him down too much. No, too much. Yeah. Yeah. no more comments. You don't remember yeah. none of the positive. You don't remember the negative. But yo, the listeners out there, man. You know what I mean? Anybody can go to jail. I was locked up with a lot of. Characters from different walks of life. You hear that, Bill? <laughs> Anybody <laughs> can get locked you up. You on Sesame Street, man. You too can go to jail, Bill. <laughs> I was in there with judges, DAs, detectives. Yo, my prisoner friend just said that the other day. He in there with engineers, farmers. Bill, I was in there with billionaires. Like, engineers? Anybody can get locked up. Mistakes happen. You, you know what I mean? You could make a mistake, a fatal mistake, and end up going to jail. And from any walk of life. Look at uh, Martha Stewart. So... What I'm, what I'm saying that is just, you know, stay out of jail, man, so you ain't got to eat that crap, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> For real. Stay out, out the corner store. Stay out the corner store. Yeah, man, stay your ass in the street, man. Do the right thing. And on that note, on behalf of Prodigy, Kathy, Yondali. There it is. I got it. Finally. After, Sugar after, Steve. After 20 years. Sugar Steve, damn. Sugar Steve, we didn't even 
bring up your sugars. Sugar. Yeah. <laughs> your sugars. <laughs> your sugars. That's how the sugar-free cookbook. Exactly. You go to prison and get diabetes, or you can just hang out with you and get diabetes. No, no, whatever, whatever. Unpaid bill, boss bill, Fontigolo, and Margaret. Oh, you. Margaret, how many prisons you been to in Jersey? I, I like five. Oh, Margaret you know. been everywhere. <laughs> you been on prison tour. Wrong way. Yo, this is Questlove, Questlove Supreme. We will see you on the next go round. Thank you very much. Yep. See you later. Questlove Supreme is produced by Pandora and Team Supreme. <laughs>